Good morning. I call to order the annual meeting of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Our annual meeting has three items of business. They are establishment of meeting dates for 2023-24, report of the nominating committee, and other business. Let's move at this time to the first item on the agenda, which is the establishment of meeting dates for 2023-24. The proposed dates were developed in accordance with the board's bylaws and policies. Is there a motion to approve the dates as outlined in the docket? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Colleagues, any discussion on the dates? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion carries. The 2023-24 meeting dates are approved. At this time, I will now use my prerogative as chair to take up item number three, which is other business. Regent Verhalen, I believe you have other business to bring before us. I do, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a resolution was circulated to all regions yesterday. There's a copy in front of each of us as regents. Mr. Langworthy is placing a copy of this uh, out for anyone uh, who's here in the boardroom to review. Um, but just very briefly, uh, I am uh, proposing a resolution that would create the position of co-vice chairs for a two-year trial period uh, beginning July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2025. And so, Madam Chair, I move the resolution before the board. Is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion on the resolution? If I could just very briefly, yes, Madam Chair. Yes, if you would like to indicate the basis of the resolution. Thank you. Um, I had made the original motion back in April for an, a very short period of co-vice chairs uh, and a board chair. And I am moving this now for a trial period, a two-year trial period, um, really for a couple reasons, but one of the, the largest reasons is to for this board to continue evaluating our general overall leadership structure. And without having to create new titles of positions and all the things that go along with that, uh, at this point in time, I am proposing that we uh, continue with co-vice chairs, a single chair with the uh, additional clarifications provided in this motion to give this board an opportunity to evaluate uh, what our future leadership structure might look like. All right, thank you very much. Any other uh, comments or questions? Yes, Regent Turner. I support the idea of, um, thank you, Chair Miran. I support um, Regent Verhalen's um, suggestion because from my world, I'm used to something called like an executive board where you've got president first, second, treasurer, you know, secretary. Not quite used to the treasurer and secretary being staff, but that's a conversation for a different day. But the advantages I could see is that it is it provides more inclusivity. You know, more people are inclusive in the, for want of a better word, the inner circle kind of thing. Um, it allows for people, not saying any of us that are new to it would want to be jumping into this kind of a role, but if you had somebody that wanted to um, try something out like that, being a, a, a chair of this kind of a board, um, they could feel like they could get on board at an earlier stage kind of thing, like as the second vice chair, you know, kind of a working, because that's kind of how it works in other boards where you kind of work your way up kind of thing. Um, so it allows people, because it is only six years, and it it's just gives more opportunity for people to have more leadership opportunities. And it also, um, I think it, it 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 broadens the representation at that at that level. Thank you, uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I would just echo that and thank um, Regent Verhalen and OBR um, for putting this together. I think it expands leadership opportunities, um, which is good, particularly in the next two-year period where we we're going to have lots of activities 
going on. And thank you, um, Regent for Halen, for leading our pilot programs. <laughs> um, you're the pilot program person on the board, and it's good. Um, this is <laughs> this is uh, this is another good pilot program where I I like thinking about it in the vein of um, evaluating our overall leadership structure. So I think um, that was a particularly um, interesting point to me and one that I resonated with. So just want to uh, say thanks and indicate my support. Thank you. Uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Mayor. And I'm going to um, take a different view. I'm not a fan of this resolution. And my reasons are threefold. One is I don't think that um, this gets at the heart of the issue we're trying to solve. And I think um, what I'm hearing is looking at our leadership structure, um, expand leadership, uh, expand the executive committee. Let's look at that within the processes we have, which is my second point. We have a, a policy review. My preference would be to go through our policy review so that we have a broad um, view on it, on the framework as a whole, and can look at that. And then my third reason is we have um, a nomination process that will be coming up next. And by moving on this now, it didn't give people who may have been interested in a co-vice chair um, position, leadership position, the chance to think about that and raise their interest and put their name forward. So um, those are my reasons why I'm not a fan. Any other comments uh, or discussion by uh, individuals here around the table? Yes, <coughs> Regent uh, Todd, Tad Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> <I mean, laughs> Right. Sooner or later, I'm going to get it right. Big I'm just going to go TJ. Uh, All right. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair, and, and thanks to um, uh, Region for Halen. And I, uh, we recognize this is not uh, the usual makeup of the leadership of of this board, but I think the state of Minnesota is changing um, rather rapidly, and I think the board is changing for the better and changes is difficult sometimes and uh, change is always difficult and doing things um, you know that are new and I see this as very innovative um, you know I think moves uh, the board in a in a good direction uh, towards the future uh, so I'm going to support it and I again thank uh, those who are willing to serve and and uh, the, the the two people who have served as the vice chair and the chair, um, our, le our leadership team, I think is excellent. So I hope that that continues. And, and um, again, thanks to, uh, thanks to Regent for Halen. All right, thank you very much. Any other comments, questions by any of my colleagues? All right, uh, hearing none then, um, we will vote on the resolution. It will take two thirds vote to approve. Um, in our, do, do we do this by roll call or we do it? Better. Okay, we'll do it by roll call. Um, so if, Executive Director Steves, if you could call the roll. On the Verhalen resolution, Regent Davenport. No. Regent Davenport votes no. Regent Farnsworth. Yes. Regent Farnsworth votes yes. Regent Gully. No. Regent Gully votes no. Regent Hipsch. Yes. Regent Hipsch votes yes. Regent Ruth Johnson. Yes. Regent Ruth Johnson votes yes. Regent Tad Johnson. Yes. Regent Tad Johnson votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Tayurabe. Yes. Regent Tayurabe votes yes. Regent Turner. Yes. Regent Turner votes yes. Regent Verhalen. Yes. Regent Verhalen votes yes. Regent Wheeler. Yes. Regent Wheeler votes yes. Chair Mayron. No. Chair Mayron votes no. The vote is nine to three. The resolution does pass. Next, we will hear the report of the nominating committee. Thank you to Regents Davenport, Farnsworth, and Ruth Johnson for their work on the nominating committee. Regent Davenport, as chair of the committee, would you please deliver your report and the committee's nominations for board officers? Thank you, Chair Mayron. The nominating committee unanimously uh, voted to recommend the following individuals to serve as board officers 
officers for the 2023-25 term, Janie Mayron to serve as chair, Doug Hipsch to serve as vice chair, Brian Steves to serve as secretary, and Myron Franz to serve as treasurer. Thank you, Regent Davenport. The report of the nominating committee places those individuals into nomination for board officer positions. Are there additional nominations for any other officer of the board? Yes, Regent Turner. Chair Mayron, I'd like to nominate um, Regent Kenyanya for a, the second vice chair. All right. Do we need a second for that or with nominations? Is Thank you very much. The nomination is placed in. Any other nominations? All right, hearing no additional nominations, nominations are now closed. We have the following nominees for each office. Janie Mayron, Chair. Douglas Hipsch and Mike Kenyanya, Co-Vice Chairs. Brian Steves, Secretary, and Myron Franz, Treasurer. Is there a motion to elect these individuals as a slate? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion carries. The following individuals have been elected to serve as officers for the 2023-2025 term. Janie Mayron, Chair, Douglas Hipsch and Mike Kenyanya, Co-Vice Chairs, Brian Steve, Secretary, Myron Franz, Treasurer. Unless there, <laughs> unless there is any additional business, that concludes our annual meeting of the Board of Regents. Any other business? All right, the meeting is adjourned and wait. <laughs> I call to order the regular <laughs> June meeting. Now we have to break. No, no break. <laughs> Not quite yet. <laughs> All right. We will begin our meeting with the introduction of our new senior leader. Uh, please join me at the podium. President Gable. <laughs> she knows. She knows. All right. And we are joined, of course, by Janet Schunk Erickson. So Chair Mayron and members of the board, it's my pleasure to introduce our friend, Janet Schunk Erickson, as the new chancellor of the University of Minnesota Morris. Chancellor Erickson began her Morris career in 1998 as an assistant professor of English and advanced to multiple administrative positions, including vice chancellor of academic affairs and dean, leading to her appointment as acting chancellor in 2021. In that role, Janet advanced a number of initiatives. There are too many to share, as you can imagine, over a career this long. But I will focus on a new enrollment strategy, establishing very strong and renewed relationships with alumni, tremendous outreach into the community and with corporate partner friends, and active and ongoing collaboration with our tribal community partners and the tribal historic preservation officers. Janet has a demonstrated and really unparalleled commitment to and passion for UMN Morris and the Morris community. She leads with the highest degree of integrity and has always lived the values of consultation and shared governance. UMN Morris is a unique and world-class institution with a strong and tight-knit community that's really committed to academic success and excellence. Janet's 25-year tenure is now just getting started with countless contributions to and leadership of that path to distinction, and I have no doubt that she will continue to serve and captain to new levels of achievement. We all already know Janet and admire her, and so I'm so happy to have her at the helm of UMN Morris, so please congratulate me, or join me <laughs> in congratulating her <laughs> in that new role. Congratulations. <laughs> President Gable and Chair Mayron and Regents, thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve the University of Minnesota Morris as Chancellor. It is one of the top 10 public liberal arts colleges in the United States and a distinct educational experience in Minnesota's land-grant research university. The University of Minnesota Morris I am never tired of talking about. It fuels innovation and improvement and it contributes to a healthy and diverse workforce and communities across the state and well beyond it. 
I am honored to lead a campus that is nationally ranked as one of the 50, 50 best undergraduate liberal arts and sciences universities in the nation, with the distinction of having the lowest cost of attendance after grants of any of those top 50. I look forward to working with all of you and to making the University of Minnesota Morris successes better known and more widely appreciated. Thank you. Oh, yeah, orange key. Oh, what? Sure. Why don't I mess that up, too? Gotta get up. Just stop. Sorry. No, I didn't. I would like I didn't want to ask you. And I did that. When I stayed in here. And I put the other note. Oh, are you serious? Yeah, we're going to get it. Oh, great. All right. No, I'm fine with my car. Did you get a new one? Actually, it's been a while since your last. That's true. We said meet you too. That's right. That's right. Anybody's new? Yeah. 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 My daughter went to Mars. It's great. <laughs> Don't go far. It's got a, s a right. special place in my heart. It was, it was a boarding school. Yeah. Um, it is now my honor to present President Gable with the Certificate of Recognition. I'm going to hand it to you. <laughs> you know what? I'll put it right here for now. <laughs> and then I'll hand it off to you. Okay. All right. This certificate here. Beautiful certificate. Reads as follows. The Regents of the University of Minnesota appointed Joan T.A. Gable as the 17th president of the University of Minnesota in 2019. During her tenure, she led the university through some of the most challenging years of our history. She navigated a global pandemic and its continued disruptions through a time of seismic shifts in higher education and great change in Minnesota. Despite those challenges, she engaged across the university community to, to chart a course for the university's future by developing Impact 2025 the university's first comprehensive system-wide strategic plan. This plan set clear goals and expectations for how Minnesota's only research institution will further strengthen its mission-driven work. During President Gable's tenure, the university has achieved record-setting annual research expenditures, as well as unmatched startups, patents, and private giving, including the completion of the $4 billion driven capital campaign at 10% over goal. Collaborations such as NextGen Med, a partnership between the university, the Mayo Clinic, and Google have enhanced the university's impact. President Gable lever leveraged the Impact 2025 priorities to advance the president's initiative to prevent sexual misconduct and to launch the president's initiative on student mental health. She also deepened the university's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and spearheaded a review of the university public safety and new building naming process and renewed relationships and engagement with the Minnesota's 11 tribal nations. The regents of the University of Minnesota express deep appreciation to President Gable and confer upon her the title of President Emeritus, effective June 10, 2023.
I have a whole report to give in a minute, so I'm not sure what I'm going to say here. But I will say um, that I'm obviously incredibly humbled and honored to receive this designation that um, being the president of a university like the University of Minnesota is uh, a culminating moment in anyone who works for and is committed to students, faculty, and staff, and the mission of public research universities, and to be a part of the ongoing legacy of the institution and have that be recognized in this way is <clears throat> um, very meaningful to me and my family and an incredible honor and I'm very grateful for uh, everything we were able to accomplish together as the chair just detailed, knowing that it is um, very much a team sport with many members of that team in this room and many, many others who don't get the thanks that they deserve, but that I hope they feel the appreciation. And so with that, I'll reserve the remainder of my remarks for the report that I'm about to give on the status of the university with great appreciation for, for this honor and for all of the time and, and years that we've had together. Thank you very much. At this time, I would like to uh, recognize the contributions of the faculty consultative and senative consultative <coughs> outgoing chairs, uh, and that is Colleen Flaherty Manchester. If she could please come up to the podium. Well, Chair Flaherty Manchester, this is your certificate, and I'm going to read it to everybody. The certificate reads, the Regents of the University of Minnesota recognize with great appreciation the exceptional dedication, service, and contributions of Professor Colleen Flaherty Manchester, the 2022-23 Chair of the Senate Consultative Committee and the Faculty Consultative Committee. As chair, Professor Flaherty Manchester has been a strong advocate for faculty while providing effective leadership in consultation with the Board of Regents, the president, senior leaders, and other partners across the university system. She led governance involved in numerous important university matters, including the resolution outlining employee investment to maintain and enhance mission delivery and faculty reinvestment. This included inaugural unit level service awards and best practices in workload allocation and compensation, among a number of other key system-wide initiatives. 
The university has benefited greatly from Professor Flaherty Manchester's thoughtful stewardship of faculty governance and her integrity, commitment, and contributions to the greater good. On behalf of the University of Minnesota community, the regents of the University of Minnesota express their deepest gratitude to Professor Colleen Flaherty Manchester for her outstanding leadership and tremendous service. Thank you. Have you go around the horse first? <laughs> <laughs> oh, pictures. Yes. <laughs> 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 I went to her bookstore yesterday. Oh, yes, I'll. In time for about 15 minutes. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> 75,000 people in the system, so it's hard to remember. And she's in Portland. I kept that thing. Can you frame them all? Yeah. Don't go far. Yeah. <laughs> At this time, we are going to uh, be honoring the outgoing chair of the Civil Service Consultative Committee, Tony Fusey. And I believe, President Gable, you have a few remarks that you're going to make, or not? <laughs> no, I don't. You do not. All right, then if uh, uh, the chair, Tony Fusey, could come to the podium, please. hand you your certificate. <laughs> All right. Uh, Chair Fusey, I'm going to read the certificate. The Regents of the University of Minnesota recognize with great appreciation the exceptional dedication, service, and contributions of Tony Fusey, the 2022-23 Chair of the Civil Service Consultative Committee, S I'm sorry, CSCC. As Chair, Tony has been a dedicated proponent for the civil service staff. Over the past year, he led governance involvement in numerous important university matters, including working to increase wages for civil service employees to market rates, updating the civil service employment rules and the civil service constitution, bylaws and rules to reflect adding Juneteenth as the additional paid holiday, and clarifying language for civil service employees who work on weekends. These are just a few examples of the tremendous body of work that the CSCC accomplished under Tony's guidance and navigation. The university has greatly benefited from Tony's ardent advocacy of staff governance. On behalf of the university community, the regents of the University of Minnesota express their deepest gratitude to Tony Fusey for his distinguished leadership and service. Thank you very much. And at this time, I would ask Adolfo Correo Cabello to come to the podium, please.
going to hand you your certificate. <laughs> Go. All right. The certificate. Uh, before you reads as follows. The Regents of the University of Minnesota recognize with great appreciation the exceptional dedication, service, and contributions of Adolfo Carreo Cabello, the 2022-23 Chair of the Academic Professionals and Administrative Consultative Committee, PACC. As Chair, Adolfo has served as a strong advocate for PNA staff. Over the past year, he led governance involvement and advocacy using transparency, equity, and accountability as the guiding principles. Under his leadership, the PACC offered diversity, equity, and inclusion educational opportunities, worked to ensure equitable representation of diverse and unrepresented groups <coughs> committee, and used a robust multi-step consultative process to foster increased awareness of accountability in shared governance. PNA leadership and PNA Senate engaged with the Board of Regents, university leadership, and others under Adolfo's guidance to address numerous initiatives, including the wellness program, region scholarship, and workforce reinvestment. The university has benefited greatly from Adolfo's astute advocacy of staff governance. On behalf of the entire university community, the Regents of the University of Minnesota express their deepest gratitude to Adolfo Carreo Cabello for his excellent leadership and service. Thank you. We, we had a slight glitch, some blinking went on, so we are having one to redo our photo again. <laughs> Fifty percent of the photographs. I don't know. My eyes are blinking. Oh, I closed it. <laughs> I <know. It's> <clears throat> my wife is like, Dad. <laughs> in all these photographs, your eyes are closed. <laughs> That's not about those kind of flash things I used to use when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I would have fairly large pupils and blue eyes, and always get the red reflex. So I look like some scary red eyed monster. <laughs> All right, well, moving on to the next item, it is the approval of the minutes. That is the next business item. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing no questions or comments, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. 
At this time, we will hear the report from President Gable. Thank you, Chair Mayron, co-vice chairs Hipsch and Kenyanya, and members of the board. Today, I present to you my 32nd and final president's report. Over the last four years, these reports have aimed to provide you and the whole university community a robust status update on key initiatives and transparent look into what's happening across the university system. They've highlighted our important focus on university history and student mental health, on innovative distributed learning and work to become the community of belonging we must be, on public health and safety, including how we've navigated social unrest in a global pandemic, as well as on how we robustly engaged in a variety of ways from legislative to corporate to tribal partners amongst many other stakeholders and constituencies. These reports have been opportunities for us to celebrate our shared success, like the tradition of highlighting a range of items that make us UMN proud, including welcoming Paul Bunyan's acts here two years in a row. <laughs> they have mourned our losses, like that of former Vice President Walter Mondale, alumnus Arnie Sorensen, and Regent Eileen Herr, all warm, caring, and generous friends to this university. Members of the board, ultimately what I hope these reports have affirmed is what an honor it has been for me to serve as president of an institution like this among a community of learners and leaders that elevates our state and society in difference-making ways at a world-class level. I'm truly humbled and honored to have been a small part of those important advances during this historic chapter within a book with over 170 years of pages. And I'm filled with gratitude at the honor bestowed upon me today. And also when I think of all we've done together over the last 1400 plus days, not that I'm counting, to make the uh -huh. University of Minnesota system stronger and better and to ensure that its best days lie ahead. So members of the board, it's in this spirit of appreciation that I offer updates since our last board meeting. Last month, the 2023 legislative session closed with the legislature approving more than a billion dollars in investments with three of our six requested budget items in part or fully funded, including competitive compensation, modern security infrastructure, and the American Indian Scholars Program. Further, the legislature's infrastructure bill allocated $43.35 million for the university's higher education asset preservation and replacement or HEAPER needs and funding for needed renovation at Fraser Hall and the chemistry undergraduate teaching laboratories at the Twin Cities campus. Also, Governor Walls signed a bill that ensures that the academic health facilities on our campus, including the University Medical Center East and West Bank facilities and the Masonic Children's Hospital, cannot be owned or controlled by a for-profit or out-of-state entity. We sincerely appreciate the legislature's actions over this session, and I, of course, express my appreciation over these last years to support the university in these efforts and meet the needs of all Minnesotans. At last month's meeting, you heard an update on the university's sustainability and climate action work, and then again yesterday from the Duluth campus. I'm pleased to report that since then, and as one of our measures under Impact 2025, we've received the latest Times Higher Education Impact Rankings. These are the Sustainable Development Goals rankings that I've referred to many times during different reports. We have moved up and are positioned in the top 10 in these impact rankings in several individual measures, including um, zero hunger, where we are number three in the United States and 14th in the world, and good health, where we are number two in the United States and 44th in the world. Um, with regard to public safety, members of the board, our team continues to work around the clock to ensure the health and safety of our university community. I'm going to reserve going into detail on the status of our partnership across different stakeholders and jurisdictions around public health because uh, around public safety because Senior Vice President Myron Franz will be making a more robust um, report on that later today. But I do, after a little while, have a COVID update for you. Um, it's been, did you miss them? I'm thinking maybe no. Um, <laughs> throughout the pandemic, our approach to keeping our community as healthy as possible was informed by a shared governance committee and public health guidance from our own medical and public health experts in partnership with state and national experts. We've entered a unique point in the pandemic where those experts strongly believe consistently COVID-19 will be with us for the foreseeable future, but that for most COVID-19 symptoms have become much less severe and that the burden on our healthcare system has similarly eased. We also know much more now about the effectiveness of the available COVID-19 va vaccines on both individual health, which they're exceptional, and on preventing transmission, which they are not as effective as we had originally hoped. 
Thus, although COVID vaccines have an important health benefit for individuals, the public health benefit of reducing community spread is less clear and appears to be, based on the guidance of our experts, less necessary at this stage in the pandemic. While the university will continue to facilitate and strongly encourage COVID vaccines and boosters and testing, our medical and public health experts have proposed the retirement of administrative policy COVID-19 vaccination and safety protocol requirements for university employees and student workers, that is the name of the policy, and the removal of the COVID-19 vaccine from the list of required vaccines for students, in part because COVID vaccines are very effective at reducing serious illness, hospitalizations, and death, but do not have the same level of effectiveness in reducing transmission. COVID vaccine individual health protections wane over time. Federal and state law no longer include COVID vaccination mandates, and the university's efforts are best focused on ongoing public health education and support of vaccine access rather than defending and tracking a policy mandate. We've consulted broadly with members of our university community about this proposal and the proposal to retire the administrative policy through the president's policy committee, which is the standard practice. And that has recently um, completed its 30 day open comment period. With that, we, university will retire the vaccine mandate policy and will remove the COVID-19 vaccine from the list of required vaccines for students. And this will be effective on July 1st, 2023. It's been a long journey through this pandemic. I want to extend my sincere appreciation to this board, to the faculty, staff, and students for their questions, feedback, advocacy, engagement through an incredibly critical, very difficult, but also a time where we really revealed what it's like to come together as a community. And though I'm not sure that we would in any way have chosen for the path to progress in the way that it did, it did reveal the strengths of this community and, and we have emerged stronger. Um, in similar uh, emergence from history, um, I want to give this board an update on an important next step in our university history work. Um, last fall, the All University Honors Committee, or AUHC, began reviewing renamings and retention of name submissions for the four oldest named buildings across the system, Falwell Hall, Sanford Hall on the Twin Cities campus, Keel Hall and Spooner Hall on the Crookston and Morris campuses, respectively. Um, there is no outcome of this work yet. I offer an update that the committee's work continues and we expect their recommendations to be brought forward for the board's final consideration sometime during the next academic year. But I couldn't let this effort pass without expressing my sincere appreciation to the AUHC, including Chair Tim Johnson and the whole committee and University Senate Director Aaron Heath for all of their efforts in this important work. There is no playbook for this type of historical analysis we are the first university undertaking the work in this way, and they are leading the charge. And I think this university community and campus will be much better for it. But it is worth the time to ensure that we do it right. At the May Mission Fulfillment Committee meeting, we discussed next steps in the development of the university's tuition and pricing model, which was the last remaining deliverable at that time for Impact 2023. So um, as we noted then, we've hit every Impact 2025 deadline and completed or launched all scheduled initiatives. And that only happens when the whole committee and community work together. Um, each member of this community, I hope, feels pride in what Impact 2025's outcomes and impact have been, but especially the shared governance leaders who we just had the opportunity to acknowledge, who represent the stakeholders and communities that make all this work happen. Um, I'm extremely grateful to all of them. So members of the board, since the May meeting, I've had the opportunity to engage our community in many important and meaningful ways. And as I typically update you, I'll share those with you today. I participated in the Twin Cities graduate and undergraduate student conferral ceremonies, the James Ford Bell Library Gallery and Period Room celebration. Um, I've engaged cabinet, SLT, system council, FCC leadership, the university's research academic cabinet, and worked through the NCAA Pathways program where I serve as a mentor. I had my um, board service with Council on Competitiveness, my last Big Ten board meeting. I participated in a panel in DC with the State Department as part of my Fulbright board service. And I had the um, honor of hosting the APLU Community Engagement Commission at their annual summer meeting at the UMD campus, where we were hosted by birthday boy, Chancellor Dave McMillan. It is, in fact, Dave's birthday. And I know he's so happy to spend it here with us today. <laughs> Very grateful to be able to engage across the community and to represent this university nationally and internationally. 
and members of the board, as has become a tradition, I'd like to close my report with some shout outs that make us all UMN proud. So a shout out to the University of Minnesota family for the progress we have made every success, every achievement, all those green marks on the strategic plan, the qualitative things like students describing an increased sense of belonging, the advocacy that we see effectively coming out of University Senate is the direct result of your hard work, resilience, and collaboration. A shout out to this board for your role in advancing this institution amidst headwinds and pressure with a shared focus that we built together through MPAC 2025. A shout out to my OOP team, Eve, Angie, Orbe, Katie, Bill, Megan, Maggie, and Brianna, and Penny, if you're watching, the cabinet and the SLT, the finest teams anyone could hope to ever work with. I'm going to get you know, don't if you start, I'll start too. <laughs> a shout out to our faculty for your dedication to discovery, for your caring and expertise, and advocacy for our students along with their academic and career journeys. A shout out to our staff who make this institution run so smoothly and effectively and for helping to elevate the university's surging national and international reputation while remaining a community of warm hearts. A shout out to our donors, supporters, and alumni for showing the world what it means to represent Minnesota to the world and for your generosity and passion that make the university stronger and better in every way. And a shout out to our students for being our heartbeat. Your optimism and hope lift us up and we're better for the ways you challenge us with new ideas and diverse points of view. And lastly, members of the board, a video shout out about all the great recent happenings across the university. Mm. With that, Madam Chair, I conclude my report. Thank you, President Gable. Turning to my report, June marks the end of the board's annual work plan, so I'd like to use my time this morning to briefly reflect on the work we've accomplished over the past year. We reviewed enrollment numbers and strategy on each campus, as well as system-wide enrollment coordination to position the university for continued success. We achieved many milestones in the MPAC 2025 strategic plan, and it remains a fundamental planning document guiding future work. We maintained a sustained focus on enhancements to public safety on the Twin Cities campus. We endorsed a bold new vision for the university's medical enterprise. We engaged with the university's shared governance groups throughout the academic year. And we heard from many constituencies, including a very thoughtful report from the student representatives to the Board of Regents. And while we're on that uh, point, my board colleagues and I want to take a moment to thank each of the student representatives for their service to the board 
over the past year. Your role in bringing the student voice into our conversations is greatly appreciated. Although this year's work plan comes to an end, our work is ongoing. In July, the board will spend time with interim president Ettinger and work to establish key priorities for the 2023-24 year. I look forward to sharing those priorities with the university community in the fall. And finally, I'd like to express and acknowledge gratitude for Sarah Dirksen's tremendous service to the Board of Regents. Sarah, are you here in the room? She was earlier. No, there she is. Sarah, come <laughs> up and run, but you can't hide. Please come up here. <laughs> Sarah has served as Deputy Director and Associate Secretary in the Office of the Board of Regents for nearly 11 years. She will be leaving the board staff this July to pursue an exciting new chapter in her career. While we are happy for her, we will also miss her leadership and counsel. During her tenure, she has served as a trusted advisor to 34 regents, manage the operations of the board office, including behind the scenes during board meetings as she is doing right now, led a myriad of special projects and partnered with the executive director to ensure good governance practices. There is no part of the board's work that has not benefited from Sarah's strategic and creative influence. If you've worked with Sarah, I would encourage you to congratulate her before she departs the university, and you can do that right now. On behalf of my colleagues, I'd like to extend the board's sincere gratitude to Sarah for her service. The next item is item four on the agenda, and that is to receive and file reports. Please note that those items reported in the docket materials. The next item for review and action is the consent report. There are four items outlined in the docket materials. Is there a motion to approve the consent report? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing and seeing no questions or discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All, aye. Those, all those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. We're going to take a short 10-minute uh, break, and then we will resume uh, for the report by the SEC, FCC, the CSCC, and the PACC. Thank you. So 10-minute break. We'll be back uh, at uh, 1040. <laughs>
with the deputy to call the Board of Regents meeting back to order. Next, we will turn to item eight, the report of the Senate Consultative Committee, Faculty Consultative Committee, the Civil Service Consultative Committee, and the Professional Administrative Consultative Committee. Well SCC, FCC Chair, Professor Colleen Flattery, Manchester, uh, and, S and CSCC Chair, Professor Tony Fussy, and PACC Chair Aldolfo Carreo Cabello are here with us today. While the presenters are getting ready, I'd like to stress the importance of shared governance within the university system. The work is undertaken by each of the consultative committees is essential part of the decision-making process at the university. Chair Flaherty Manchester, if you're ready, would you like Actually, to proceed? If I can make some introductory oh, remarks. But before that, Sorry. President Gable is going to make introductory <laughs> remarks here. <laughs> okay. To make. All right. Uh, as I would probably have done over there. Uh, all right. Thank you, Chair Mayron and co-vice chairs Hipsch and Kenyanya and members of the board. So uh, I just want to say how fortunate we are to have, as I've said many times, but definitely want to say today, one of the strongest, most functional, most robust, most active and engaged university senate shared governance systems amongst certainly any place I've worked and I know amongst our peer institutions. It is a community. It's the reason for all of the good work that the University of Minnesota does. And I want to extend my appreciation to um, all of our leadership currently and past over the last four years um, for their advocacy and partnership through some of the most interesting times. And. Um, in addition to thanking Professor Flaherty Manchester and Adolfo Correa Cabello from PAC and Tony Fussy from Civil Service and Pavan Gudapati from the Student Senate Consultative Committee, I want to thank Aaron Heath and our Senate office staff, Chris, Missy, Amber, Jessica, um, Jeanette, and Bobby for their shared service and commitment. They are really excellent and run what can be a very um, complicated operation and they really make it look easy. So I'll be very forever grateful to all of our governance leaders and very much look forward to hearing their reports today, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Chair Flaherty Manchester. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Chair Mayron, Co-Chair Kenyanya and Hipsch, and members of the board. On behalf of Vice Chair Mark B and my other colleagues in the Senate Consultative Committee, which is the SCC, as well as the Faculty Consultative Committee, the FCC, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present to the board the spring semester report for each of these groups. As a reminder, the SCC is the Executive Committee of the University Senate, which has membership from all four constituent Senate bodies, and the FCC is the Executive Committee of the Faculty Senate. A central charge of each committee is to serve a consultative function, which includes receiving concerns of constituents, advising university leaders on decision making by elevating the perspectives and experiences of our constituents. Our university system has earned a national reputation for having a robust and functional system of shared governance due to a broad constituent base, high caliber Senate staff, dedicated faculty, professional administrative employees, and civil service employees, as well as students who are elected by their peers to serve, as well as the recognition of the importance of university shared governance by the administration, as well as by the Board of Regents. So I'll begin my SCC report um, by talking about a major focus of our recent work in the University Senate, which has been identifying ways that the administration and the Board of Regents could mitigate the significant strains on the used workforce due to the prolonged declines in state funding that were exposed and exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, the social justice unrest, rest, as well as the high inflation period. The culmination of this work, which has been a collaboration between the faculty, the PA employees, the civil service employees, and the students, is a resolution that recently unanimously passed the University Senate entitled Workforce Reinvestment, Rebuilding a Better You for Employees. This landmark resolution is ex exemplary of the potential of our university <laughs> shared governance system to address complex challenges facing higher education. It provides the administration with a blueprint for making needed investments in the workforce that are grounded in the experience and expertise of those supporting and delivering on the mission. So I'm just gonna show on this next slide. 
I'm going to be an illustration of the core content of the resolution. So the central statement of the resolution is that the University Senate requests that the University of Minnesota administration invest in its employees as the centerpiece of its efforts to maintain and enhance leading edge mission delivery. The resolution articulates four core, core principles, which are listed on this slide that we seek for our workforce, which is to provide livable, equitable, and competitive pay, to recruit, reward, and retain our employees, to establish clear pathways for professional development and career advancement, and to foster a culture that promotes manageable workloads. The resolution identifies investment prior priorities which vary in scope under each of these principles, <coughs> and it asks that the administration respond with an assessment of the expected time horizons for investing in these different priorities. Finally, the resolution requests that the University of Minnesota administration identify ways to institutionalize the workforce as a centerpiece priority for mission delivery, including in its interaction with you as the board, the legislature, and the governor's office. So this resolution will be the a focal priority for our committee, the SCC, as well as university governance leaders this coming academic year under interim President Ettinger and beyond. So given I wear two hats, I'll now return to my report from the FCC, which is the Executive Committee of the Faculty Senate. So in the fall, I shared in my report the marked decline in experience in faculty engagement, a 16% decline between 2021 and 2019. So this decline in faculty engagement has actually spurred an increase in engagement on the part of our committee. We have been proactively listening to our faculty constituents. We have used that listening to develop priorities. And this year, we have been taking action on those priorities. Before I get into the priorities in action, why does faculty engagement, or furthermore, employee engagement matter? As shown in this slide, if you look at all five commitments of Impact 2025, promoting student success, being a research powerhouse, serving the state, impacting the world, being equitable, diverse, inclusive, and responsibly stewarding our resources, all work that requires the effort of our, under, of our employees, with faculty directly delivering on that three-part mission. So the highest priority of the FCC this year has been faculty reinvestment. Our faculty constituents have told us that compensation, recognizing undervalued service work, and addressing workload challenges have, been, have the greatest potential to positively impact the faculty employment relationship. These are listed on this slide, and taking action on the pri these priorities this year on behalf of faculty, as well as in part of the Workforce Reinvestment Resolution, has been and will continue to be the focus of the FCC. I'll now bring the board up to speed with our committee's actions. I'll start with the, the third listed reinvestment area, addressing workload challenges. The overall level of work is one challenge, as well as the distribution of workload to faculty within a unit. Is it? So on the second piece, the FCC leadership has reached out to the Office of Human Resources and found a willing partner. Together, we are reviewing results from the most recent employee engagement survey and outlining a data collection strategy aimed at identifying best practices for how work is allocated to faculty within units with equity considerations in mind. Further approaches for addressing overall levels of faculty workloads are listed in the Workforce Reinvestment Resolution under Principle 4. The second listed reinvestment area is recognizing undervalued service contributions. So this work and effort that's essential to the, our institution, but, but yet is often undercounted or uncounted when recognizing our employees. The FCC has engaged with the Office of the Executive Vice President president and provost on this unmet need and partnered to establish an inaugural unit level service award called the Award for Excellence in Academic Unit Service, which recognizes individual faculty for their positive contributions to their local unit. This recognition begins to acknowledge the long-standing efforts by so many faculty that go above and beyond to enhance this university. The importance of recognizing institutional service is also reflected in the priorities listed under principle two of the Workforce Reinvestment Resolution. And so finally, this first listed priority on the slide is compensation. The importance of this topic for faculty and employees in general at the university cannot be overstated. Spurred by voices of faculty, the FCC 
leadership has moved from collecting anecdotes from faculty to now compiling spreadsheets of data on salaries to compare over time and across institutions. We've taken this proactive role because of our responsibility of understanding the concerns of our constituents, as well as our priority of elevating the importance of investing in competitive compensation to the board, to the administration, and to the state. The FCC has been actively following this issue and recently raised concern with the Office of Human Resources about this year's change in procedure for computing the compa ratio shared with the board. Namely, the May 2023 Board of Regents Finance and Operation Committee report showed a compa ratio for the Twin Cities campus that used all R1 Carnegie institutions, nearly 150 universities, which was a departure from its prior set of 34 institutions. When constructing these comparisons, we are raising questions about the importance of using peer institution comparisons, including the Big Ten, highlighting differences by rank, accounting for differences by discipline, addressing nuance when comparing campuses, and as well as incorporating cost of living adjustments. We have reached out to the compensation team in the Office of Human Resources, and they are very interested in getting faculty compensation comparisons right, and are sharing and have shared their plans to do a market refinement approach similar to what they have done to faculty for the Duluth campus that you heard about in your May meeting. The FCC is at the beginning of these conversations with OHR on what this market refinement approach would imply for the Twin Cities, Morris, and Rochester faculty, as well as to what extent the process addresses the concerns we have heard from our faculty constituents. Importantly, the process of assessing compensation is one part of addressing the challenge. In addition, having the resources to invest in competitive compensation is fundamental. We urge the board to keep competitive compensation at the forefront in terms of its priorities, given the central role our people play in mission delivery. So that concludes my report. Thank you for the opportunity and for your service to the institution. I'll now turn to Chair of the Civil Service Consultative Committee. Chair Fussy, thank you. Thank you, Chair Mayron, uh, Chair Mayron, members of the board. First of all, again, thank you for inviting us here for this kind of first time, I think, of having all three of us in front of you. Uh, since you have a copy of the formal report in your docket, I won't read that verbatim, but I'll highlight a few uh, items from there. Before I get into that, I just want to introduce myself. As mentioned, my name is Tony Fussy. I'm the chair of the Civil Service and Consultative Committee, or the CSCC for short, and also the leader of the Civil Service Senate. I'm originally from the Northwest suburbs, Crystal to be specific. I graduated from Ramosal Armstrong High School, was the first in my immediate family to go to college with the help of my parents. I was part of the first freshman class admitted to Carlson School of Management in 96, graduated in 2000 with a Bachelor of Science in uh, Business with an emphasis in MIS. I was also lucky enough during my employment here at the U through the Regent Scholarship to complete my MBA at Carlson as well, graduated in 09. I've worked at the university essentially since graduation in various colleges and departments across campus, including the School of Dentistry, Facilities Management, and for the past 21 years, the Global Programs and Strategy Alliance. I've worked as an AFSCME represented employee for 11 years, including being involved in the two strikes in the 2000s. 11 years ago, I was reclassed to civil service and have been since 2012. Now I'd like to share with you a little bit about who civil service employees are. We're an often forgotten, overlooked employee group, even though we're the second largest employee group after P&A. This means there's more of us than bargaining unit employees and also more of us than faculty. There are over 5,000 civil service employees working on all five campuses, as well as its extension offices and research stations. From the 17 employees on the Rochester campus to over 4,700 here at the Twin Cities campus, we're all over the state. I'm a finance professional three, financial generalist, and work with everything from budgeting to fiscal year and closeout, approving and preparing payments to settle, setting our program fees for our study abroad programs and overseeing the finances of our China Center. Civil service employees are editors, graphic designers, finance employees, buyers and category managers, administrative directors, recruiters, project coordinators, Senate associates, just to name a few classifications. We work in research, administration, finance, IT, communications, and HR in every college and every central unit from the controller to libraries and from the chancellor's office at Crookston to CLA. As the president mentioned, we're the people that keep the university running, most of it behind the scenes, so the university can fulfill its missions. The average civil service employee at the U has worked for about nine and a half years. There are about 2,600 that have been here. Um, if you've been here at least five years, we have an average of 17 years of service. There are 1,700 of us that have been here at least 10 or more years with an average of 22 years of service. 
And finally, over 900, myself included, have been here um, over 20 years, including 20% about of the civil service uh, employees. And we have 20 plus years of university experience and service to our great institution. Now that you know a little bit more about us, I'd like to share about some things we've been working on this past year. Over the past two years, working with many offices across campus, we are happy to report with your, after your approval a few months ago that Juneteenth is the newest university uh, holiday on the calendar. We work with the civil service constituents and many offices across campus to make this happen. Instead of reallocating an existing floating holiday, as was the original plan, we felt it was important to recognize this holiday with an additional day off, the first in many years at the university. We thank the regents for their approval of this change in the civil service employment rules to make this happen. This winter, we were happy to have one of your own, Regent Davenport, to join our CSCC meeting. We try to inv invite at least one regent, if not more, if there is time, to come meet with us uh, during the year to continue formal and sometimes a little less informal dialogue between the regents and the Civil Service Senate. We had a very informative and lively discussion with Regent Davenport. The fact that she's worked so extensively in higher ed uh, in different roles allowed us to delve deeper into subjects that she's very familiar with and has had to, and has had to work through during her career. The Civil Service Senate, as part of the larger Senate, continues to work on with our university Senate colleagues to equalize the representation of civil service employees in the Senate Consultative Committee, as well as committees on the university Senate to make sure that each of our four Senates, civil service, P&A, students and faculty, have a more balanced representation, not just necessarily based on the number of constituents represented, but each having an equal voice. <coughs> is also a shift away from having one group having a larger representation in the University Senate than the other three. This is a long-term plan that we've barely scratched the surface on, but we will continue to work on into the future. We continue to work on civil service employee engagement on the CSCC, the Civil Service Senate, and other bodies across campus that seek out civil service employees to uh, partake in them. As of late, we are finding it harder and harder to recruit uh, constituents to volunteer in these committees and senates across campus. We are especially struggling to find representation on our coordinate campuses in the CSCC and the Civil Service Senate. We have heard that people would like to take part, but they do not have encouragement from their supervisor to leadership within their units and departments to take part due to their workloads. Engagement across campus in these communities is vital to a holistic viewpoint in matters that affect all civil service employees and the more voices we hear, the better we can represent the whole body. I would ask from the regents to the president and on down to encourage supervisors to allow employees to volunteer more on these committees, task forces, and other ad hoc groups that often, but not always, the charge of committee will directly relate to and affect their unit. But even if it doesn't directly relate to their job, it builds bonds across the university that will become useful in their job, even if where they were volunteering on doesn't have a direct correlation. Peak, civil service, civil service senators and myself continue to take part in meetings with peak supervisors, leads and others regarding this monumental project before us. While there are areas we can definitely see benefits to everyone, I will tell you this, employees are nervous about this project. What began as a project for efficiency across campus, and that is still the focus of the project, saving money in the long run has now become a secondary priority that has crept in. When most employees across campus apply for their job three months ago or 30 years ago, they applied to a, for a job in a specific unit, a department or a college. They took the job because it aligned with their values, with their interests, or for some, it was just a job. With the four affected groups of HR, finance, IT, and communications, many employees are nervous about the change that's about to happen. The recentralization of a decentralized university has many people unsure about their future. As mentioned, I and others can definitely see where consolidation makes sense to get consistent messaging and answers on subjects. But what worries people is that these new jobs will have less variety in the position and become more of a processing facility for various tasks. We hear that this will create more opportunities for upward advancement, but when you're only doing one or two types of tasks, it is hard to see how that helps you prepare to move up the ladder. People are hesitant to preference for these jobs that are now opening in phase one because it's kind of the guinea pig for the project to see how it works. It was refreshing to hear that uh, HR Vice President Horseman has said that they're gonna start doing more meetings in person with staff that are affected by this first phase of peak and into the future. I hope these are very engaging two-way conversations where both sides can ask questions of what's going on with the project. What does it mean if I preference in 
What does it mean if I don't do so? Will I still have a job or not? In an HR check-in this week, I expressed my hope that these meetings include staff that are much closer to the affected staff, such as peak supervisors, peak office staff, etc. And not just, not just those that have the vice president in their title, to get a better sense of the concerns that everyone has, has about this project and that has been deemed too big to fail. In closing, civil service employees want the university to be successful. We know how important the U is to those who attend it, to the the U, how important it is that the U accomplish its amazing research, and also how important the U is to our state. We are hard, more, hard workers having to do more with less, especially a fewer coworkers. With the retirement incentive option a few years ago, COVID layoffs, and other employee reductions, employees are facing more and more burnout and the inability to take vacation because there's just too much work, and vacancies either are not being filled or they can't be filled due to the job market. Those of us that have been here for a long time know that change is inevitable. And for many like myself, change is hard. And as Regent Tad Johnson said, change is difficult. And all of us civil service employees are doing our best to manage change, accept it, and work through this. It's been an honor to work with the great people of the Civil Service Senate, the other Senates, the Senate office, and all the offices across campus that I've had the opportunity to work with this past year in my leadership role. And with that, this concludes my report. Thank you very much, Chair Fussy. At this time, we will hear from Chair Adolfo Carrillo Cabello. Uh, thank you, Chair Mayor, and uh, thank you, uh, members of the board. I would like to start uh, by thanking uh, all board members on behalf of the 7,451 PNA employees at the university system who live and work in every corner of our state to uh, deliver an oral report. Today, it marks the first time that we are doing this <laughs> since the creation of the PNA Senate 12 years ago. We have a lot of catching up to do, but I only have 10 minutes to <laughs> talk to you, <laughs> so I better get, uh, keep going. Um, I would like to start by telling you a little bit about myself. I'm actually Dr. Adolfo Carrillo Cabello. I'm an immigrant from Mexico who has the privilege and responsibility this year to represent the voices of PNA employees um, serving as chair of the PNA Senate and the PNA Consultative Committee. Uh, in my day job, I'm a technology enhanced language learning specialist at the CLA Language Center in the Twin Cities campus and directly support language instruction of 14 language programs in five language departments here uh, at our Twin Cities campus. Uh, PNA employees carry mission critical responsibilities, including teaching, research, and administration. Many PNA employees directly support programs that benefit Minnesotans across the state who are in direct contact and in dialogue with citizens of the state. This year, um, our group, uh, the PNA Consultative Committee, grounded its work on three principles: transparency equity, and accountability. This approach afforded us the opportunity to align our topics of priority and to successfully engage and contribute to timely conversations with other governance groups and central administration, as well as developing and carrying out crucial collaborations. While the principles are simple, they can transcend context and increase the level of impact of our work. This year, for example, we focus on providing educational opportunities to our PNA employees that aim to increase their level of agency that they can have as PNA Senate members and employees that were able to advocate at multiple levels, including in their local context. To this end, we had a diverse group of presenters and learning opportunities at each of our Senate meetings that provided tools and strategies that increase our knowledge of how governance works, how administrative processes are carried out, and how engagement and feedback can be used as strategies to drive advocacy and change. While we were successful in many of our efforts, I'd like to dedicate my time with you this morning to highlight some of the challenges that our employee group faces that directly impact work, working conditions and work satisfaction. Uh, first, 
uh, I'd like to talk about the employee development education and training policy, which is a Board of Regents policy. In particular, I'd like to focus on the Regents Scholarship Program. In 2009, the Regents Scholarship was cut to 75%. This cut was proposed in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis as a way to demonstrate that the university and its employees was taking a share of the economic hit. The Board of Regents approved the reduction in March 2009. While the cut may have translated into savings, it also has created access barriers for employees that prevents them from taking advantage of this employee benefit. Our Senate has prepared a report that summarizes the lived experiences uh, of the PNA employees uh, who have experienced significant challenges accessing this benefit. I invite you to review the contents of this report, which is referenced in the workforce resolution. Uh, the shared lived experiences point to common characteristics of those who have not been successful in accessing this benefit. Bilingual, bicop, single parent women are less likely to succeed in accessing this benefit. Next, I like to uh, turn my attention to performance management for academic, professional, and administrative employees. Uh, we operate in a highly decentralized institution, uh, and it's expected to be changes in inconsistencies in terms how some processes and procedures are, are applied, as well as inconsistencies on how terminology is interpreted and applied. Um, however, we have noted that some of these uh, interpretations have led the way to the application of interpretations that create unnecessary pain points for some of our employees. Uh, we also note that there seems to be a lack of training that creates ambiguity that translate to inequalities, and it, we run the risk of weaponizing some of the processes in many cases. Uh, lastly, I would like to call attention to recruiting, hiring, and retaining employees, in, particularly, in particular, as it's outlined in the C CCL resolution, which provides arguments for strategic investments. Let me tell you about what, I, uh, what we hear from the ground from our PNA employees. What we hear is that in addition to uh, losing people, more importantly, we are also losing institutional knowledge. Knowledge that sometimes it's extremely hard or impossible to recover. In addition, uh, we would like to call your attention to the diversity of PNA employees. Uh, which I outlined in my written report. Finally, um, the campus climate survey, you can provide ideas on, uh, for opportunities that can improve a perception of working climate and working conditions. This concludes my report. Thank you for your time. Thank you very, very much. Very much appreciate the comments that have been uh, made by all three of you. Any discussion or questions by any of my colleagues? Yes, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and I just want to thank all the presenters. I'm thrilled that we're able to have all the um, different Senate consultative committees here um, as a first, and I'm, I'm sure we'll continue that. I know a lot of folks were um, involved in making that happen within the board, so I just want to thank um, everyone for that and uh, just kind of highlight two things I heard. I heard more than two things, but um, two things uh, stuck out. One, um, I had had the pleasure of visiting with the PACC um, this year and really enjoyed time together with that group. And uh, I remember uh, the issue on the Regent Scholarship came up. And I'll be honest, I didn't know what that was. Um, at the time, and I thought, well, it's called the Regent Scholarship. I better brush up on that. Uh, and so, of course, it's it's way more important than that. That my levity was not meant to <laughs> meant to signal that. But uh, I really appreciate following up with that today. And then there's some, uh, you know, I feel like it's 
it is a scholarship, but I feel like it's way more than just its name. So I'm glad we talked about it uh, today and we can follow up with that. The other thing I heard um, that particularly piqued my ears um, within from the civil service consultative committee was the whole idea around um, whatever we can do as an institution uh, to continue to encourage a flexibility to participate in shared governance. Uh, that is really important and I've never, I've never thought about that in terms of how that relates from a staff standpoint, having participated in it myself as a student, but then interacting with the board um, and uh, just whatever you know we can do to informally or formally um, nudge that along because it is true that we have an outstanding uh, nation leading, Big Ten leading, all those qualifiers, shared governance uh, system. And so, um, you know, whatever we can do to, as the board to continue to nudge that and make sure that everyone feels like they have the flexibility to participate in it, I think is really important. So um, those were a couple things. I also heard the commentary about peak, which I think I'll save for the peak agenda item coming up next. Um, but yeah, I was just really thrilled to have all the leaders here because I've seen a lot of these presentations. Uh, and it's so great to have everyone here presenting to us today. So thank you. Thank you, Regent Farnsworth. Regent Gully. Um, thank you, Chair. And I just want to thank all of you for being here today and for your presentation. Um, there were a lot of, there was a lot in the presentation, which was wonderful. Um, one thing that I wanted to personally highlight was that um, I love the idea of expanding the region scholarship, especially considering the conversation that we've been having over the last couple of days about how many um, positions even within the university we have that we need more people to do them. And I think that when we have staff and faculty who are already invested in the university that we should be giving them the tools to um, take on some of the challenges that we have here and, and outside as well. Um, and so I realize that this is a much longer conversation but one thing that I did want to mention is uh, I, I totally agree with you about the importance of expanding the scholarship, especially for um, from an equity perspective. Um, adjuncts are not eligible for the Regent Scholarship because we do not consider them, at least to my knowledge, and as an adjunct, I was not eligible for the Regent Scholarship, no matter how many classes I taught, because you're not considered a percentage employee, so you don't get that qualification. So even when I taught seven classes in one year, which was the most I was ever able to teach, um, there was no way to get to a place because you're not, you don't get a percentage marker. Um, even when I had multiple jobs in the university, I was not able to access the Regents Scholarship. So I would love for us to not only consider improving the Regent Scholarship access for people who already have access to it, but considering how we can um, broaden access for other folks who um, might be able to take on more leadership in the university if they had the opportunity to get the skills and the tools that they needed to do it. So thank you. And thank you, Chair. Thank you, Regent Gully. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for obviously the presentation today, but just your service, you know, in general um, to your peers. Um, Regent Farnsworth was surprised to find out he doesn't qualify for the Regent Scholarship. The name may be a little misleading there. Um, but no, I mean, I, I just want to echo the, um, the importance of having, you know, this representation and having all of you um, present here and being able to hear those perspectives. And it, we've always been happy to have FCC, but actually, I mean, it's, that's kind of a, a, I don't say burden, but, you know, we can relieve you of that responsibility of having to represent, you know, all the different groups and whatnot. Um, so appreciate the presentation. I know I've enjoyed the, the opportunities we have via Zoom. I recall them three by threes, maybe, I think, yep. Um, you know, those are really helpful. And um, just to be able to, to hear, to hear uh, these perspectives, and and on a, um, also on a more, you know, we have this. I know we have sometimes the after the meetings we'll we'll have a reception with with some of the Senate members, and that's so helpful because you don't want to hear about something once it's reached kind of a boiling point. You as leaders are so helpful to us to be able to say, hey, this is what we're hearing. You know, it's not it's not a big thing yet, but that you know that's so helpful um, to hear. And to Regent Farnsworth's point about facilitating, helping facilitate the service, because it, it is a big. I mean, it's a big commitment. 
and you're taking focus and time away from, um, you know, your other responsibilities, your research, you know, whatever else that may be. Your, um, and I know, I know you mentioned, you know, it's similar with student engagement. I, I know in the attendance policy, in the university attendance policy, um, Senate is exempt. Uh, system wide, specifically system wide uh, governance is exempt for students. Uh, um, you know, I know faculty and staff attendance policy would be a little different, maybe not that simple, but, um, you know, again, like how do we think about that and make sure that we're putting those accommodations because, you know, we want faculty and staff to have these experiences and they want to have them and these are the kind of things that we're probably, I imagine, like a tenure panel is looking for, but then at the same time, like how are you balancing that with, you know, every other thing. So um, just echoing those comments um, and, and, and thanking you all for, for your time. Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. Any other comments, questions? Yes. May I make a comment? Absolutely, yes. Please uh, Chair do. Mayor, I just want to react to the comment by Regent Gulley uh, in regards to the uh, Regency Scholarship. I just like to mention that oftentimes what we hear from our employee groups is not about the process about uh, of getting um, the scholarship. Is so for some of us, it's not making it to the door that prevents us from getting access. So it's before getting into the, uh, the application process and such. So there are many circumstances that uh, inform how those processes are. Like I said, for our employee pers group perspective, uh, seeing this as impacting a bilingual, bico, single parent women is very worrisome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very Madam much Chair. for those comments. Madam Anything? Chair. Yes, uh, Regent Kenyon. Can I just ask um, for clarification? Certainly. Thank what you. do you mean by the things preventing them from even getting to the door? Can, can you can you expound on that a little bit? Um, Chair Mayor and uh, Regent Kenyanya, yes. Um, we have information available uh, about the, um, the Regency Scholarship, however, the application process entails um, going under several, several gatekeeping uh, processes uh, before an application is approved. Um, and so it's going through that process before you actually have a signed application that you can submit to officially request that benefit, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments or questions by colleagues? All right, thank you very much. Really appreciated your presentations and, and really appreciated having all three groups here presenting to us. I think that was really helpful for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this brings us to item number 10, which is an update on the PEAK initiative. I'd like to welcome Senior Vice President Franz and Vice President Horseman to present. Senior Vice President Franz, as soon as you make your way to the presenter's table, if you'd like to start us off. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. And uh, thank you, President Gable, for your leadership on this critically important initiative. Uh, Vice President Horseman and I uh, would like to take an opportunity today <clears throat> to provide an update on the PEAK initiative. There's been much work uh, on the current first phase of implementation that we're now engaged in, but I'd like to start today by providing context of why this work is so important. We chose the name PEAK, Positioned for Excellence, Alignment, and Knowledge, because the initiative must always seek excellence. We must continually adjust for new challenges and, and must be based on knowledge of what is best for our talented workforce to adapt to the future. <laughs> Adaptation for the future is really just another way to say the word change. Change is never easy and we must always seek to address the inevitable challenges that change brings to our workforce. And by the way, change is coming no matter what we do. We understand the concerns about change that have been expressed, and we understand that we must work together to address these challenges together. Our people are our greatest asset. Our faculty and staff 
drive the university's mission of world-class education, groundbreaking research, and community-engaged outreach, and are foundational for our continued success. PEAK is about working together. It's about people, it's about work, and it's about service, which means providing equitable and consistent world-class service, value, and outcomes. Importantly, the PEAK initiative is not about reducing staff, and it never has been. The goal of PEAK is a realignment of people <clears throat> excuse me, of people and utilizing their talents the way we will be working in the future. We found our, in our analysis in the spring of 2021 that many of our talented staff wear several different hats in their work. They do every day. Often people will work across multiple HR functions, payroll, travel, leave of absence, or any number of different unrelated tasks, marketing or website design. In fact, if a unit or college is small, there may be just one person or a small group of people performing a wide range of activities, which limits their staff's ability to develop deep expertise in one area and limits their path for advancement. PEAK ensures a more efficient, compliant, and equitable service delivery at the university, both for employees delivering and receiving those services. And importantly, PEAK provides a pathway to successful career building at the University of Our Talented Staff. If you recognize any of that, President Gable, that's because I stole a lot of that from something you wrote earlier, uh, several years ago, and it still stands true today. Let me start by describing the challenges of higher education for the University of Minnesota and for higher education in general. American higher education specifically faces a range of demographic, economic, technological, and societal challenges. As you examine the challenges listed on this slide, I think it becomes apparent that the university must adapt to address these challenges, such as changing student dem demographics and enrollment pressure, something we've been talking about th this session with the board an increasingly competitive market that we've talked about, changing infrastructure needs, declining support from federal and state sources, competition for talent and involving hybrid workplace, evolving, I should say, expanding societal and environmental responsibility, and rapid tech, evolving technology. The challenges listed on this slide have been discussed multiple times at past board meetings and will be in future meetings, I'm sure. These challenges remain as opportunities for the university now and into the future. We also know from our shared experiences that many of these challenges listed were exacerbated by COVID-19. To address these challenges, we began our analysis in 2020 to better understand what other universities were doing. But let me mention some history around the challenges that I just described. In 2012, the university was scrutinized in a Wall Street Journal story about the level of our administrative costs. Some of that criticism continues to this day. Although the factual basis of the story was not fully accurate, nonetheless, the university faced increasing scrutiny over its administrative costs. Many universities have faced similar scrutiny. Initiatives like PEAK and our commitments in Impact 2025 not only ensure that we are spending our limited resources more effectively and to a greater benefit to all, they are important steps in minimizing the university's risk and our public reputation. The university faces an institutional challenge listed on this slide that include operational efficiency and expectations, peer institutions adopting shared service and centralized service approaches, and fiscal stewardship. The challenges that include the obligation to maintain our operational efficiency in areas that where we can make improvements without compromising the needs of students, faculty, researchers, and staff. More and more, our peer institutions, including the Big Ten, are engaged in a, a transformation of their service area. Their projects include both shared services and more centralized delivery of services, along with technology components. As a public institution, we are committed to being good stewards of our resources and ensuring that services are delivered in a cost-effective way. Similar projects to PEAK are currently underway at Maryland, Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin, and have taken place in the last five years at Penn State, Ohio State, and Purdue. 
Other public higher ed peers in our group are equally engaged in similar projects, including in Texas, New Hampshire, and Utah. The same pressures have challenged institutions across the higher ed landscape to find avenues to safeguard investments in our students by realizing improved operational efficiency. One pathway toward that goal is through a more collaborative approach to service delivery. In fact, this is not a preferred or recommended path to take, but an absolute requirement to safeguard our current and future investments in students. We have discussed the ge genesis of this project and why it is critical. Similarly, in the past, we have discussed the goals and outcomes this project must achieve. You can see the goals uh, overview and the goals listed on this slide and some of the outcomes. If you look at the, um, the, the top goal on the, on the top right, improve efficiency of cross-functional service delivery and redirect capacity to support impact 2025 goals. Well, impact 2025 goals, that would be the mission of teaching and research and service for the university. At the start of this project, we were also informed by the university community through, the, we used surveys, assessments, focus groups, interviews, that functional support and service quality were highly variable and inconsistent across our system. Assessments revealed a wide variance in processes across campus, colleges and units, which indicated a need for increased structure and compliance. Interviews and discussions with university faculty and staff highlighted that many units could further their goals and mission through improvements to structure, process, and service delivery, all leading to increased compliance, thus reducing cost. As we discuss the current implementation stage, you will see an emphasis on our earlier learnings now that we are defining the actual processes in the, for the future. We are also keeping the project's principles in front of mind, which I can summarize briefly as follows. Our people will have equitable and inclusive opportunities for professional growth and specialization with the newly created functional teams. Our core work will be structured around shared resources for human resources, finance, and marketing and communications. People-centered services will be optimized while, main, while minimizing risk and will be delivered consistently, consistently and equitably across all campuses and units. Madam Chair, I'd like to now turn it over to Vice President Horseman to continue. And I'll just hit that button, right? Yep. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, Vice President Horseman. Thank you, uh, Senior Vice President Franz, uh, Chair Mayeron, members of the board. I'm gonna walk through uh, what has been going on recently with phase one and um, how we are proceeding. Uh, the first phase of implementation of PEAK includes the four system campuses, the colleges of the law school and Humphrey School, and the three central administration units of finance, uh, information technology, and human resources. For each campus, college, and unit, transition teams are organized to support the future transition of work and work with their employees and supervision. They are currently working with affected employees at their location and with our central project team. The learnings from this initial process will inform the subsequent phases of the project. In later June and early July, we will also start to meet with phase two units who have already reached out and are considering what they can do now to be best prepared. And so we will have that kickoff meeting uh, during that time frame. And as I said, some phase two units are already contemplating the work in their colleges and units and how this may change and how it can best support uh, their, their mission. Go ahead. We are currently at the fourth milestone of the implementation process. I know you have received many concerns and questions directly on this process. The expression of interest process intends to be a supportive, respectful process for eligible employees who often will be joining a new central organization and performing the same or similar work. There have been many channels of communication during this milestone and in the last three weeks, we have transitioned to in-person meetings uh, and meetings that involve the direct working supervisors for the central units not the VP. Um, and uh, the initial meetings show a lot of promise for how we can move things forward. Um, 
We will continue the in-person effort through the phase one EOI process. And so far we have met with UMD transition team members, supervision and employees, and the same with Humphrey. We have met with leadership from Humphrey and the law school. Additionally, we will be visiting Crookston, Rochester and Morris yet in June for similar meetings. Uh, we are talking to the chancellors about what is the best environment to do so uh, and having them inform how we engage them. The in-person meetings are much more productive, much more two-way conversation and valuable to everyone engaged, including phase one participant, central offices and consultants. And I'll just stop and say, we have also provided feedback to Huron over the course of this project. And we have had um, consultants roll on and roll off of the project. Currently, we have a robust team from Huron who are not first consultants. They are practitioners who have worked in higher ed, have managed operations centers in HR and finance and have actually done this work and learned from how not to do it and how to do it, and they speak our language. So that has been a change in the last two or three months that I appreciate Huron listening and making, and uh, we have uh, a pretty cohesive team now where we maybe didn't have that in, in the past. Um, expression of interest has been discussed during various peak forums in 2023. Uh, the phase one expression of interest process was announced on May 9th and forms were distributed. The initial final date for phase one EOI was May 31st. And we did initially pattern this off of what we know in our environment, you know, open enrollment, other obligations people have to make decisions and make elections. So that was the initial thought when we looked at that time frame. During May, we held webinars for supervisors of eligible employees and employees themselves. Webinars do have limitations on how we can check for understanding, so the next step has been the in-person process. Um, I think, as I mentioned, the recent processes at Duluth and Humphrey uh, resulted in increased understanding and impressed on us the need to continue this. So we're on the same page and have clarity heading into actual implementation. During May and June, Monty Vang, our Senior Director of Labor and Employee Relations, has been meeting regularly with AFSCME leadership to bargain on the expression of interest process for AFSCME employees. Together, both sides have reached a tentative MOA and AFSCME members will have an opportunity on June 20th to vote their decision on that MOA. It covers various aspects of daily work that could be impacted as a result including such items as travel. If you are working on a system campus, but part of a central organization, what does that look like if you have occasionally the need to be in person in the cities or at another campus? Probation periods when you move to another role, how transfers will work in the time frame of the agreement itself. Given the schedule of the June 20th vote, we concluded and agreed with ASME leadership that we would now extend uh, the final date of the EOI period to June 21st. 21st, and that does not delay our work. It simply gives people more time to engage and understand how they fill out the process and whether they wish to participate. <clears throat> Our continued next steps will involve, as I said, in person, but also review an assessment of what we hear during expression of interest and how we can support those currently engaged in the process. We are in the midst of looking at the onboarding and training of individuals joining an operations center and remaining to work on their campus or in their colleges and units to assess and design remaining positions at their location. We will identify hotel office space at each campus that will allow for remote and hybrid work for those employees now working uh, in a central organization but wishing to remain on their campus. We will demonstrate and test services and processes so that we are prepared to offer a complete and responsive level of service from the very start. Transitions uh, to the actual work in these operation centers 
would begin in late summer and there will be timelines for transition for phase one from approximately August through the end of the calendar year where we think phase one will be complete. During this time, we'll also make progress on planning for the next phase. Throughout this project, which has admittedly been a lengthy planning and design period, we have strived to be open, honest, and transparent, and we have adjusted our approach and plan based on feedback from leadership, from faculty, staff, student workers, from phase one campuses, colleges, and units. It has been difficult and challenging, both for us working on the project and those feeling like sometimes we were doing it to them. I think we're getting over that bridge now. Uh, and it has taken some time to address that in a line. Delaying this project, however, pausing it completely does not support the long-term needs of the university. Taking the time now that we are dealing with substantive parts of this project at the campus and college level, truly working together, having a shared ownership approach with those it truly affects immediately is how we address the outstanding questions, concerns, and time frame. Delaying that will just increase the work we have to do and will not lead to the understanding we need. We do want to respect a person's interest in the work as much as possible. We do wish to retain current staff. I have not talked to a peer institution that uh, as a result of this work with their current uh, uh, group of employees has realized less employment. They may realize cost avoidance in the future as they're aligned and more requirements come on top of them, but they have not had a workforce reduction as a result of, of this type of work. Um, we feel this approach will allow the university to su a successful transition and uphold the principles of uh, honoring individual rights as is prescribed by policy rules and labor agreements. <clears throat> You know, as an example of listening and learning, I'd like to offer what we have heard recently in our sessions and what we plan to do different moving forward. As I have described, we have already made some of these changes. Coming out of the pandemic, meeting the daily challenges present in our environments and adding to the list of challenges, a significant project like PEAK, of course, has been a factor in people feeling exhausted and higher anxiety and concerns. Admittedly, people are tired, contending with many aspects and challenges of life. I personally know my team that is working on this, as I would guess in finance, IT, and Marcom centrally, are extending their work weeks just for this project and have been doing that for a long time uh, to keep going in their current work. And I know that is, is occurring on campuses and in colleges too. The extra effort to do this work is still there. Energy is not limitless. Peak did not necessarily create all of these challenges, but the addition of it certainly can exacerbate the challenges. Further details continue to be requested. One example of uh, addressing uh, this type of request is we recently were able to start sharing standard operating procedures being developed for the HR Operations Center with those who may be working on it and are currently doing the work, albeit in a perhaps a different way. How the processes are laid out informs phase one supervisors and transition teams also on the work remaining in their unit. Another example is the simplification of the project website so the immediate concerns and questions are front and center, specifically answered and easily accessible, much like we did with the Use Safe website during the pandemic. That work is currently underway. We, we acknowledge we need to allow people time to adjust and acclimate to new roles and leaders and supervisors time to understand their changed environment as well. So how do we address these needs? As we mentioned, uh, we need to be face to face going forward. We will use other channels we have used, but no longer as the main vehicle, but in support of that in-person work. Our university communicators have taken ownership of the communication strategy for this, so it is appropriately in our hands and not uh, defaulted to the consultant. They know how we historically communicate the cadence and channels used. Human resources, both locally and centrally, must be fully engaged. The earlier in the discussions, the better, the better uh, to support leadership, 
the transition team supervision and employees. In addition to the bargaining process with Ask Me on expression of interest, we have also, I will say, received copies of the recent petition. I did have a few minutes to speak with Ask Me leadership in person last week when they delivered it to our office. While we have not paused the project, I think the uh, extension of EOA uh, and the um, openness to moving it to June 21st is a result in part of the petition we received and the thoughts that accompanied that petition. Um, so we will continue to follow those principles. I would like, before we go to questions, um, just uh, as I was thinking this morning about this and respecting the comments and concerns raised, I wanted to take a moment to think about what our world would be like if we don't go forward with this work. Um, initially, there probably is relief. There would be some free time for some people. There would be probably less anxiety about the unknown. But what we would continue to see are examples such as findings and audits before the audit committee indicating that decentralization and fragmentation lacks proper controls. We have current examples of that, and it's not a result of people not diligent and committed, but it's a result of the confusion caused by a system-wide process that's done locally and differently across the system. We would continue to have inconsistency in hiring, in offer letters, and on onboarding and orientation. There would be greater employment risk for processes related to the employment life cycle the entering of leaves, the entering of um, augments, the entering of updates uh, to salary pools, uh, changes in positions. Um, less likelihood, probably, of complete leadership and supervisor training. Um, it is a very decentralized approach right now. It is a march of the willing. And because uh, many of the factors that uh, Chair Fussy mentioned, certainly uh, keep people at work and not necessarily voluntarily taking training, but in a more systemic environment, this would be something we would need to complete and we could do it in a more scaled way. Likely in a decentralized environment results in more leaders and more supervisors. You know, I, I think uh, when you're disjointed and you have different groups working in silos, you tend to have more people with oversight than you might if it was streamlined. There's much less cost avoidance in the future as individual units continue to add resources when needed for the same type of work. Local decisions on decentralization, in many cases fragmentation, can continue to occur because they're doing with good intention what they think meets the need for their immediate area. When we come back to this type of project, if it was set aside, there likely will be even more of it that we will have to study and analyze. Continued issues for staff development, and this has been a request daily by staff leadership. I've spent many hours speaking with Adolfo about this uh, in regard to P&A, and I appreciate his perspectives. Knowledge and capabilities develop and grow due to work experiences often for staff. And the likelihood of this past existing is much less without peak. It really is. It's hard right now to identify what you might like to do differently or where your current training and skills take you. Turnover will be more of a challenge. We talk about people leaving because of peak. People will leave if peak doesn't happen. Um, we have if spoken to our institutional peers doing this work. Local employers have this. People leaving and going to a local employer will likely find an environment similar to what we might have as a staff when we get through this. And it's not a corporatization, it's simply adapting good practices around employment and uh, administration that support your mission. PEAK actually uh, supports increased equity and inclusivity. It does it because our current state will be more readily visible and transparent after PEAK. We cannot ignore it any longer. It will be right in front of us and the metrics will be clear. Without this, we are still spending time, but maybe an inordinate amount of time, simply constructing what the current state is before we can form a solution. 
And finally, you heard from uh, Vice President Galachek a while back about the next technology upgrade, and we have 10 years. I agree with the time frame on the technology, but maybe not on the implementation. But what I would tell you is uh, this process with PEAK needs to be accomplished in order for that to be successful someday. To get our process and our people right and, and trained in preparation for that very significant undertaking, which is uh, possibly several years out, is a significant enterprise risk management topic, and it's coming closer every year. So that is simply my perspective. I will turn it back to SPVP France to close it out. All I want to do is uh, offer this up for questions, so we're happy to take your questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, questions or comments? Uh, we'll start with Regent Turner, please. Thank you, Thank you Chair Marin. Um, Vice President Horstman. I'm delighted that you're starting the in-person because that's the only way to yeah. really do it. It's, I, but I, having worked in HR, I appreciate the hard work that that is, but that's the only way is to be able to lay it out individually. My question is, you talk about a vote for AFSCME mm -hmm. that's June 20th. Does that mean waiting on those negotiations, does that mean that that particular group has yet to start to have those in person? Because I kind of heard a disconnect yeah. yesterday when they're sitting wanting to stop it. Yeah. And that would make sense that they're still feeling that way if they haven't been able to start the in person. We, we have in Duluth and at Humphrey spoken with employees who are eligible, some asked me. Yes, and we right now with this first meeting, we're speaking to people who had completed their expression of interest form. But we also, as a result of that, had several people say, well, now I feel comfortable completing it. So we will have a follow-up trip, and the people speaking with them are the supervisors they would directly report to in these units. So we will commit to that. Um, what we wanted to do is give additional time for people as a result of having these conversations in person that may choose to express interest. And what I have told employees when they've asked me, you're not, you're not confirming or obligating yourself to take a different position, but why would you not look at what the opportunity is to make an informed decision for yourself? And so I think with that uh, conversation, it is an ongoing process, but they are engaged and uh, the vote itself is uh, certainly to allow the expression of interest process to go forward. And we had some um, specific uh, points that asked me wanted to make sure were clear prior to agreeing to that, and we were able to come to a tentative agreement on that. So just one. Okay. Yes, go ahead. So is that vote all the systems? Do they have a yeah, way it's, to it's, do that it's, vote? I yes. think you do these votes all the time. And yeah, yeah. It, it's, in a, it's basically an amendment to the contract that will allow during the period of peak for us to do this, and it will uh, confirm to them uh, some of the experiences people will have, how they'll be handled, you know, like I mentioned, travel, probation periods, will clarify that language for this particular process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Hipsch. Uh, thanks, Chair Maron. Thanks for the discussion today. And, you know, I know it's, I think Regent Tad Johnson said that change is difficult. And I think every one of us know that. And I think everybody understands that. And uh, I heard you say positive or delaying does not meet the long-term goals of the university. And I think you could further say that it, um, it doesn't fit our mission because if we can take more dollars and put it into our mission through streamlining processes and, and labor, I think that's a good thing. And I think that uh, you could also say positive or delaying does not meet the long-term goals of the state of Minnesota. And I think you could also say it does not meet the long-term goals of the employees at the university as well. Because, I mean, being, getting more efficient is very, very important, I think. But um, I think one of the other things that we've been criticized about um, is Huron. And most of us weren't on the board when we hired Huron. And I agree that we needed to hire an outside consultant to do help us do this work. Could you just give one sentence why it's so important to have Huron and why we're paying Huron to do some of this work. Because I, I agree with it, but I just want everybody to hear it. 
And you don't have to confine yourself to one thing. Yeah, or whatever. <laughs> no. yes. I wanted to see what he'd do. I don't care. Whatever. Make it a really, like really long sentence. Or something. No. Okay. Chair Mayor on Regent yeah. Kipsch, uh, that is a good question. And, uh, you know, we, we had different lanes you could go on a project like this, but the resources uh, don't change. You either have them internally or through an external partner. Uh, we did, uh, I think, a complete RFP. We had many of the usual suspects in this type of work, uh, large consulting firms that applied. Huron, um, as we noted, has had experience at Minnesota. They've also had deep experience in this type of work at other universities. Having said that, every university, if you've seen one, uh, a mentor told me you've seen one university. So they have some learning to do about how large and, and diverse we are and you know how to adjust maybe their approach for us too. And, and there were some pain points in learning through that process. The team we have now is exceptional with them and um, you know, I've seen a lot less conflict of ideas and a lot more of joint uh, moving forward. And I, I think that has been seen as we've gone out and talked to people. Um, there will be a time when I think this will be a mature enough process in my mind where the decision of whether or not um, we continue with outside support can be a decision we make. And that is why we're doing phase-to-phase -phase statements of work, uh, because that allows us the ability to make a decision that could be different. Thank you. Let, let me add, Madam Chair, that um, I, I think uh, Vice President Horseman said it really well about eventually this will, this will change into a continuous improvement office. I mean, PEAK is really a continuous improvement project at a massive scale. And one of the goals of the 2025 plan is for us to have a continuous improvement office, a program going forward. This will turn into, this is in essence the beginning of that and it will continue to be that going forward. But there's no way we could be here today where we are without Huron and the help that they've provided. Uh, we simply don't have the bandwidth and that experience that they brought. They've, they've learned a lot, they've experienced a lot with other universities. We know best practices. So I, I for one will just say that they've been a tremendous asset for us and we need them at least for the immediate future. And then going forward, we'll see when we convert this to more of a continuous improvement kind of an office. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Tad Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I want to thank both of you for the presentation. And um, also, you personally briefed me uh, on uh, what peak was. And I, I needed an elevator speech uh, when I was talking to legislators. So um, and I, you know, I can't explain it as well as you two. But but uh, no matter how much I explain it at UMD, I keep getting the same comment, which is and I don't know if this. I guess I'd like your reaction to it, which is over 80 positions are being cut and 41 of them are UMD. And how do I best respond to that? Um, when we uh, selected um, the first phase, um, there was other work going on on each of the system campuses that seemed like a good fit. And the attraction to having Duluth in that first phase is that in, on a smaller scale, it's, it's like the system. You know, they have uh, different schools, uh, they have, uh, you know, a significant number of students. And we thought, th and they have already done, to some extent, uh, process improvement and some centralization. So it, there were a lot of aspects of it that we felt we could learn from and take that forward. Um, the first phase does not have a large impact people-wise, but Duluth is the largest of the groups we're talking about because most of the central admin offices have very small numbers of people engaged in this work for our own office. Um, and likewise, Humphrey and Law School are smaller as are uh, the other system campuses. So naturally, um, we probably didn't foresee that uh, at that time uh, when we were looking at this two years ago or a year ago, 
But I think um, what it also allows us to do is look at uh, joint but hybrid work across the campus. One of the concerns coming forward is, will this eventually um, lead to less employment as people retire or there's transition? And I think, um, you know, with hybrid work, we can hire anywhere in Minnesota. Um, so I think the answer is yes, you, we, the positions can continue on the system campuses. And Duluth really gives us an example of how we do that well and do it at some sort of scale. Um, so, you know, some of it's unintentional, but some of it is really a good template as we go forward to phase two, which includes the College of Liberal Arts and C fans, uh, which are sizable. And uh, I think. Um, we can credit Duluth for willing to be a part of it and for having the patients go through it with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and I want to thank um, the presenters for this presentation. It's been really challenging to me to, you know, use such limited volunteer governance time to try to understand something um, of this magnitude, and so I'm glad we're continuing to talk about it. Um, at the board level, and it, it sincerely, this sincerely has been helpful. Um, two things, one, a little bit uh, follow up to what Regent Hipsch was saying. You know, I think something that would be helpful for me as a board member is to just understand more of the financials of it. Um, now really starting to understand and, and, you know, be more familiar with the phases and the personnel aspect, um, you know, just, there's, of course, the real basic question that one could pose about this, which is, um, is there going to be a financial savings from centralization? It's always more nuanced than that. Um, so I understand that. But I would like to understand a little bit more of the financial aspects of this. Um, it was helpful um, to read some of the answers um, in the memo we got yesterday from UMD staff and understanding um, the Huron aspect that Regent Hipsch just asked about as well, um, and then understanding that the foundation has contributed some funds, which I wasn't aware of um, until recently. Uh, I really appreciated hearing the extension of the EOI that's been a, clearly been a uh, tension point uh, for folks. Uh, and so understanding that, you know, we play a very different role than um, a staff person who may be looking at this that I would presume we're all hearing a lot from. And so wanting to be, wanting to acknowledge that anxiety uh, and be empathetic to that and balance that with our um, governance responsibility uh, as a board to, to see, um, you know, what, what it, and evaluate and check in on this change management process. Uh, and I'm totally forgetting the term that, that continuous improvement. There you go. Um, I think continuous improvement is generally a good thing. Uh, and I, I appreciate your framing of it that way, Senior Vice President Franz, because yeah, that does make sense that this is a big scale, long term continuous improvement project. Very much, again, understanding angst that can happen during continuous improvement. So. For me, just a little bit more about the finances uh, at a future time would be great. Uh, appreciation, appreciation that we're hearing that we're picking up on communication and the interpersonal communication aspects of change management within a large scale continuous improvement project. Um, and then just a really small thing that I took a note of yesterday uh, that was touched on a little bit is there was a comment yesterday during the budget session about uh, the need for centralized new employee orientation. I don't know anything about that, whether that exists or not, but um, that stuck out to me and I wrote it down yesterday that that seems like that would be helpful and hopefully something, a benefit we can get out of this. So, uh, you know, understanding again and, and speaking a little bit to members of the university community that have been concerned about this, uh, very sensitive to that, but also trying to look at this through um, a governance and a fiduciary lens yeah. um, that, uh, I certainly don't have any personal experience with something large scale. My very small organizational work in nonprofits <laughs> um, is nothing compared to this. But uh, I generally, you know, remain supportive um, and appreciate these kind of updates because it's always, you know, helpful to have a conversation uh, in addition to memos that we receive as well. So thank you, Chair Mayron. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Regent Wheeler. 
Yeah, just thank you. Thank you, Chair Mayor, and, and thank you very much for the presentation. And the, the, these are really difficult to do, really difficult. And having been part of some in the past, I, I understand the difficult and appreciate very much your leadership on this. I also appreciate very much the comments that we heard yesterday from people who are affected by this. That said, I, th I think that uh, you know we we have a big obligation to make sure that this university flourishes for another 170 years in the best way, and that requires change over time, and uh, that requires uh, things that allow things to be more consistently done. So we don't only not only waste dollars that can be reinvested into our mission, but we don't waste people's time and ideas either um, by uh, unnecessary duplication or difficult work, and we allow them to be their best selves and their biggest selves in their, in their jobs. So I think this is really hard and really necessary work and really appreciate your leadership in this. And I think you also, I will say, have demonstrated, I've been exposed to this for about a year now, this, this project, and the demonstration of trying to thread that needle and listen deeply to the employees' concerns and do this in the best possible way is also very evident. So, so thank you for that and uh, appreciate the efforts and I think it's absolutely something that's needed for the university to flourish long into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Wheeler. Uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I will add my expression of support to stay the course. And those of you who were here when we embarked on this, and those of you who are learning about it, we spent time talking about the difficulties we would face and the pain points and such, and it was either commit to see this through or don't. Then if you don't, we may end up like institutions down the road or others in the country where they have 15 years to catch up. So we've done things along the way, but this, this really um, not only is continuous improvement down the road, but it, it hits on that um, MPAC 2025 goal of financial sustainability, which you just spoke to Regent Wheeler. And every time when I hear Pete question or talked about, I think of those points you ended with, Vice President mm -hmm. Horstman. Yeah. And what is it that happens if we don't? And I think the consequences may be more severe than the pain points we have now. So th those are my comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, before we hear from Regent uh, Tarabi, um, uh, Vice President Horseman, did you want to speak to the uh, orientation oh, sure. um, piece? Mm -hmm. um, Chair Mayron and members of the board, um, Yes, I heard the comment yesterday, and uh, there is a, a story to go with the elimination of our past in-person new employee orientation, and it was not a budget decision. Um, we had been struggling with the effectiveness of that program. There was a lot of commitment on the part of internal staff, uh, of the employees who did come, and, uh, and third party vendors and the like who would show up to, who are employee facing to interact with new employees. But the fact was uh, very often people were not attending if they did it at all until six months after they started because it's very decentralized and because work was in the unit, sometimes they were not signed up right away or maybe in their onboarding that important point was not mentioned. Um, when they did come, we did have experiences at times where um, there were things that had been missed in their first 30 or 60 days. And so we thought, what, what if we take that effort and change this up a little bit? And what we did, and this was in 2019 without knowing the pandemic was coming, and it was just uh, timing was fortunate. Uh, we ended that. Um, <laughs> And the content we were using was very informative if you wanted to hear about the universe. You know, I'm, gonna, not, I'm trying not to sound snarky, but we spent a lot of time on the University of Minnesota in the 19th century. You know, but when someone is wondering what their disability coverage is, you know, in their first six months. So we looked at the priority of information. And what people experience now when they come is they get an email 
and it lists everything that they are obligated to respond to by a deadline. So we don't have the experience of a new hire that has cost a bit to bring in that we really want here. And within 30 days, they're upset because they missed something critical to their life. And their supervisor also gets a message to follow up with them. And we have gotten a lot of feedback that this has been well received. Uh, we have seen anecdotally less omissions of people missing an enrollment date or missing a coverage or lack of understanding of retirement. So that piece has been addressed. But onboarding and orientation is sort of an ecosystem. There's local pieces if you're in a college but there are system-wide pieces and it builds. So you have your first day and you should have stuff before you come in. And then you have to get your access set up and then you have to provide your I-9 information. But it goes on from there with immediate training, enrollments, et cetera, and it just builds through that first year. And we're still in the process of building that out. Our intention is not to ignore it but to have a robust program that really addresses the needs of our faculty, staff, student workers as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Regent Talrabi. Um, thank you, Chair Mayron, and um, thank you, SVP uh, Farms and VP Forsman for the presentation. Um, I am really always um, just taken aback by how much um, you're trying to do through PEAK. I mean, I, it feels really important. And I think um, as I was coming on, it was one of these uh, efforts that had got, that was underway, but felt very important to the university because uh, human capital is really our most important resources um, at the university among, or one of the most important resources. And I think it is really important for us to, um, just continue to stay the course as uh, uh, Regent Mayron um, Davenport uh, mentioned, because I do think that, um, you know, this process of trying to both realign um, where, where we have, um, where, what the university's needs are, but also knowing that we're not starting with a blank slate. And so I really appreciate the process and I'm also really glad to hear that there's more opportunities now to really engage with folks because, um, of course, it is impacting um, people. And I think the less that um, um, it, it is unknown, uh, the more that people will start to or will understand what is happening. So um, thank you for starting that work and um, for continuing to share it with us. Um, about that process and, and just um, want to um, say, you know, I'm, I'm supportive. I think it's uh, really helpful, but I am also hearing where there's a lot of conflation over the confusion of what, what, what is going to be happening through the process. And so I, I, I know that um, these kinds of reports are important. And I hope that there's opportunities, not just to report to us, but to report to the um, to the body of um, employees who who um, who I know you have um, invited, but um, so that they can also participate in the process. So thank you very much. Thank you, Regent Tarabi. Uh, Regent Kenyanya, did you wish to speak? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, appreciate the you know presentation and all the work. Um, you know, I, I I'm happy to hear, but just some of the interplay and, and, and communication and back and forth um, that, that we've been having. Because I, you know, the administration and the board definitely have a different perspective than some of our employees. But what, what I've hoped for is that that doesn't then shut us out to what they're saying, you know, because there may be a lot of good and, and truth there. And so, I, I, you know, what I'm hearing is, you know, some things were just lack of or miscommunication, but other things were, okay, you know, maybe we, we do need to adjust this and, and I'm hearing a fair amount of that. So I appreciate that. You know, my question, um, I guess first starts around role variety. I mean, we've, we've heard a bit about that in, in that people, um, some do, but in that a lot of people don't want to do the same thing. Um, and, you know, there's the benefit of specialization, efficiency, but you know that, that there's a push and pull there. Um, you, 
how, I mean, will there be any variety really um, in those centers and in those roles? And then, you know, furthermore, a, a lot of these roles are split responsibilities. I mean, that's the genesis, right? Where an FTE may be doing 30% finance, um, but but their you know the rest of their job uh, changes. What does that look like for the unit if if a person doesn't select to go? Um, because d does that financial responsibility still transfer to the center? And if so, you know the unit has to figure out how to fill the rest of their time. And are they are they still? Are they being then charged for those services that are, are now being rendered by the center inst instead of in the unit? Um, I, my understanding is that it is, and I think the the threshold was 50 percent for for people to be eligible, and, and that changed to 20. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I, more, more roles are, are 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 eligible. But I want to understand how how a unit can can kind of balance things out in that yeah. this work left. The employee's still here, you know, at the same cost to them, and are they are they then also now f um, being charged by the center, or you know, if that makes sense? Well, maybe I'll start and then the specialization under the budget. First. Okay, okay, uh, Chair Mayron, uh, Vice Chair Kenyana, um, those are really good questions and really, you know dense questions to, to come to the answer on, and that's what we're in the middle of, and that's what requires an in-person conversation now. Um, the threshold, I'll, I'll sort of go out of order here, but the threshold of 50 to 20, uh, that was sort of a lightning rod for some people, like how could you miss by that much? Well, th it is a small number of people and when we looked at the needs of the operation centers, when we finally determined the estimate, we had done a recent um, responsibility tracker that actually the, the local phase one areas did of their own employment situation. That really informed an update on what was needed to do the work. And from that, we determined that, you know, we have to lower the threshold and we went to 20 just to make sure uh, that would provide a big enough population. It doesn't necessarily mean everybody in that new population ends up in an ops center. Um, but that process of working together with the supervisors on campuses and in colleges and with the central project team allows us to figure out how to solve that problem. Because you're right, there are gonna be components of work. There may be work at Duluth or Morris or the law school that isn't currently being done today and needs to be done, that can become a component of a person's job if they have additional time. So we're looking at that whole landscape to come up with a final answer. And I, you know, I think as we go forward, we can provide more detail on that. That's not something we can come to a conclusion on in one meeting. But I think as we get into August and the fall, we'll have more substance around an update that can fully answer your question. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure. May I briefly? Uh, very briefly. We're, yeah, we I, still have one more presentation, so I, um, very briefly. That was helpful. Can you clarify the if units are then funding that work that left it and, and how the the center is being financed with relations to with relationship to the the units? I'll take that, Madam Chair. All uh, right, think, thank you, Vice President. Uh, one of the things that were it obviously if you oh, learned anything yesterday is how complicated our budget is. Well, we are also at the same time that we're maintaining our current budget, we're also doing a sort of standalone budget to analyze what effects these are going to, these changes are going to have on our budgeting process. Because usually the dollars follow the work, right? So if that work is being performed at a simple unit, then the dollars typically follow that, that work. But one of the things that happens in this situation, and we're, we have a project going, uh, uh, Budget Director Tonneson is working on a project to make sure that we ha have an understanding of where the dollars were and how these, these funds were spent. But I think one of the things we also want to do at the end is make sure that 
there's a lot of other work going on in the colleges and the, and the different units. And so the, those people, if they decide not to follow the particular central work, they can stay and do uh, other kind of work in the university or in the colleges and the department. So there's, there's that opportunity that, that's available too. That you know, it, There's a lot of other things going on supporting the mission of that college. So there's an opportunity there as well. Um, and the final thing I'll mention too is that, uh, so we'll, we'll be having an accounting of this going forward as we figure out where the pieces move. But one of the things I wanted to mention was that um, we have a big, we appreciate your support. We have a lot of support from the University of Minnesota Foundation, who, as you may recall last year, uh, supported our work with a $10 million uh, support of our work in, in, this, um, in this area to help us you know, alleviate some of the costs so that the units don't bear the cost of peak. We don't want the units to have to bear the cost of some of these internal um, movements. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Turner, you had one final comment? Yeah, and I, I, I use as little words as possible. Mm -hmm. um, Vice President Hurstman, in regards to just, and you may go, hey, I got this. Um, as far as an orientation, yeah. the, the purpose usually from different groups, <clears throat> why they like a formal orientation is so that they can get lists of new employees. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know, but my question would be, is how, how good a job does the HR department do at giving the various organizations, and I don't need to rattle them off, you know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. How good a job are you at getting them the list of new employee names? Um, there are, you know, I would have to check at how periodic we do that. Um, you know, there are, in, at the university, there are definitely two or three times a year where the hiring is really intense and it's at a pretty high level compared to the rest of the year. I will take an action to review that and get you an answer here in the next few days. That's usually the reason. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Gulley. Could I just, um, just a quick follow up to that? Um, so I would love a report on that, but I would also love us to be serious about making sure that those, that that information is getting out to the organizations that need it on a regular basis. Yes, we, we do that. I just want to make sure yeah, I have yeah, the facts course. in front of me. But and thank you, and thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Uh, I think what you're hearing around the horseshoe here is that uh, we're not going to pause peak. We're going to plow ahead with peak. We understand there are growing pains. There are pains with this process. It's an enormous process, uh, but it's absolutely necessary for the university, for the health of the university, and, and the, our financial health, the health of our, our employees in terms of their career development uh, uh, as well. But we do understand there are starts and stops, and, and we appreciate, uh, I appreciate what the, your groups are doing to address the concerns that are getting raised as we begin to roll this out. And I know there will be a learning curve, and there it will be better at it down the road than we are right now. Uh, but um, I think you're hearing that there, it's necessary and there, in some senses, I don't wanna say we have no choice. I just think that it, you're hearing it's necessary, it's necessary in this environment and we will work to get it right. And I'm hearing a very strong commitment from the administration to get it right. So thank you very much for your efforts in this regard. Thank you. All right, we're gonna take a very short five minute break and then we will uh, address public safety.
All right, we will resume the what I think will be the final chapter of today's board meeting. I'd like to invite back, he's already at the presenter's table, Senior Vice President Franz to share a public safety update. And uh, any comments you wish to make, President Gable, before uh, Senior Vice President Franz addresses us? <laughs> I think the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, Liz, please go easy on me today. <laughs> um, I don't have any scripted remarks to make, but I will say that um, I would like to thank Myron and uh, Matt Kramer um, for their shared leadership of this outreach uh, across our campus. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, Campus Safety Committee, which is the newest faculty or University Senate Committee, which has addressed this, because we have been through um, certainly our share of the national trend on um, crime in surrounding neighborhoods, which um, gets at the very core of uh, what makes people able to function in any aspect of their life, which is whether or not they feel safe. And if they don't feel safe, there's very little else that they can do. Um, at the same time, what we have tried to do is very, very difficult because of things that uh, are difficult for us to control, like jurisdictional boundaries and trend lines and underlying social questions that go far beyond the role of the university and the community. But it has been our fullest intention to be inclusive and representative in addressing these issues. We have made notable progress. Um, we have set up structures that are meaningful and taken the perspective and voice of what is perhaps the widest spectrum of opinions that most of us have ever had to deal with over the course of our work in higher education. And uh, Myron France has been directly involved in that with great leadership, um, including the leadership and partnership of our police chief, Matt Clark. And so I will turn it over to him, Madam Chair, for his presentation. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Now, Senior Vice President Franz. Uh, thank you, Chair Mayron and members of the board. And thank you, President uh, Gable, for your leadership in this area as well. I will start off by saying what I hope I say every time I talk about public safety, and that is safety is everyone's responsibility. And what to help people feel safe, respected, and included is something <clears throat> that we can all do at all times. And I, I urge every one of us to think about that in our own communities, with our own families, and with ourselves. So with that in mind, the university's strategic plan, Impact 2025, Commitment 5, directs the, assess the assessment and improvement of campus safety protocols and organizational structure. Under this commitment, our safety plan that we've talked about before the board lays a foundation for transforming the campus's community of culture, policies, and practices to foster a safer community on and near campus for the, next, for the future. We continue to make progress in our work and to address safety on and near our campus for this last year. I'd like to take a few moments to highlight what we've done this last year. In July, uh, uh, Interim President Ettinger and I will talk about what we're planning for the next year, fiscal 24. But over this last year, we've piloted and continued the Dinky Town Alerts program which allows members of the university community to opt in to receive notifications about safety situations in Dickytown that require immediate action. The pilot program has proven to be effective, so we will continue to send those Dickytown alerts as situations arise. Now, to remind everyone, the Dickytown alerts provide notices in the area east of Interstate 35W, south of 8th Street Southeast, and northwest of the East Bank campus. This area is outside of the legally required geography under the Cleary Act, which that act designates crime that has occurred on or immediately adjacent to campus. So this expands the reporting area to those people who opt in. We continue, as President Gable said, to meet regularly with the Strategic Safety Advisory Committee, which includes, and this list is pretty impressive, members of the University Department of Public Safety, the Minneapolis Police Department, the Office of Fraternity and Sorority Life, University Relations, the Office of Student Affairs, Minneapolis City Council, Dinkytown and Marcy Holmes Neighborhood Associations, the Alumni Association, the parent-led Campus Safety Coalition, and other student and faculty staff representatives. These meetings are an opportunity for information and idea sharing, and where ideas can get jump-started for us to work on together. 
Earlier this year, the Department of Public Safety led two safety walks in the Dickey Town Marcy Homes neighborhood to bring attention to safety issues and to offer tips for personal safety. We have more safety walks planned for the summer and we will be sure to invite the board if you're interested in attending those. We know proper lighting is, an, is a proven crime prevention strategy. Earlier this year, we completed an audit of current lighting in Marcy Homes and proposed upgrades to existing light posts. Remember, this is the University of Minnesota doing an audit of lighting in the city of Minneapolis and an adjacent next to the University of Minnesota. This is part of the engagement and our willingness to do what we can to help our neighbors. The, through our advocacy, the Minneapolis City Council approved funding for the city's budget to repair and replace pedestrian level street light systems. This included over 100 lights in the Como neighborhood and 75 in the Dickentown Marcy Homes neighborhood. During the last year, as part of our commitment to engage with members of the community, we held three public safety forums, the last one in March, with the Minneapolis City officials, including Minneapolis Police Chief O'Hara, to address the community's concerns about public safety on and around campus. <clears throat> we contracted with Allied Security to provide additional security staff to, our, to patrol our campus parking facilities in response to increased crime in our parking ramps. This security staff provides extra visibility during peak times, such as when classes let out or a work shift ends. We renewed our contract with Block by Block to provide safety guides in the Dinkytown area <clears throat> during weekend evenings. They serve as another set of eyes and ears to report crime. They also promote a safe and welcoming environment by offering directions, providing a safe walk home or to a vehicle and building relationships with the unhoused population. Again, this is the University of Minnesota providing services in the city of Minneapolis to assist in the areas surrounding the university. We are assessing and implementing additional security measures in and around our residence halls. As examples, one project adds locks to all bathroom doors of our residence halls. Another pro project adds more public safety patrols in and around our dormitories. And one more project increases the number of hours security officers have shifts at residence halls during weekend evenings and early morning hours. As you all know, staffing and public safety is a challenge, but it's not just a challenge for the University of Minnesota, it's a challenge nation, nationwide. And I'm happy to report during this last year, the Department of Public Safety has made significant progress in staffing up. In January, the Department of Public Safety hired a full-time recruitment, engagement, and mentorship coordinator to drive our long-term diverse recruitment for the Department of Public Safety positions. Thanks to her efforts and our recruitment partners in the Office of Human Resources, UMPD, UMPD has hired eight new officers, bringing our force to 54 sworn officers. They hope to have 60 officers by the end of the calendar year. Our authorized number is 71 at this point for sworn officers. The Department of Public Safety has hired six community service officers. Now these officers supplement the, the work of sworn officers by providing extra patrols, and security around the Twin Cities campus and offering administrative support. We also filed a, uh, or filled a vacant social, uh, social worker position. Now this position exists in partnership with Hennepin County and connects victims to health and safety resources. In order to support our diversity and equity inclusion efforts, we hired a system-wide public safety, equity, diversity, and inclusion liaison. This position is focused on reviewing our policies and practices within public safety to ensure that they align with our diversity and equity goals and values of the university. They will help ensure that the department programming has, is inclusive and serves our diverse community. The Department of Public Safety has a staff of 21 security personnel. Not only do university security personnel protect people and property, they also perform routine patrols, provide access control to buildings and events, promote compliance with university policies, and conduct community engagement at every opportunity. As President Gable mentioned, I also want to thank Chief Clark and the entire staff of the Department of Public Safety for their dedication to our safety on this campus and around. We are proactively addressing and responding to recent criminal activity in the Dinkytown Marcy Homes area. UMPD's jurisdiction and primary responsibility is for on-campus safety. Nonetheless, as I've talked about and we continue to work on, we are investing significant time and resources to help support 
the Minneapolis Police Department address criminal activity and improve safety in the Dinkytown Marcy Homes neighborhood. Because of our continuing concerns this week, UMPD and Minneapolis Police Department launched a joint effort called Dinkytown Safe Streets. This effort will increase over time for up to six additional UMPD officers to provide enhanced protection along with the Minneapolis Police in, in these Minneapolis streets through the month of June. Parking and traffic enforcement will begin each week and night at 9 p.m., which has become a source of part of the problem. Minneapolis police will have violence interrupters working as well. Violence interrupters are employed community members who help head off conflicts before they become serious. We are prepared to quickly deploy other public safety strategies if necessary, such as additional traffic control as needed. We are working closely with the Minneapolis Police Department, Minneapolis City Council, state legislators and community members to undertake these safety public issues and improve safety in our area. And this weekend, the Dinkytown Safety Guides will continue to be present uh, th Thursdays through Saturdays and throughout the summer, as I mentioned. I also want to mention the light rail. The light rail provides critical access to our campus for our students. Earlier this month, you may have noticed Metro Transit launched the Transit Service Intervention Project. This includes an increased police presence and community service groups that will engage with the unhoused population or people experiencing mental health and substance abuse issues. This is an all-in effort to improve the safety of passengers, many of whom are our university faculty, staff, and students. We will continue to work closely with the Metro Transit to protect the safety of all folks on, on that system. We did receive, as you heard yesterday from uh, Budget Director Tonneson, we received some legislative funding for public safety. This legislative session, we requested $5 million per year in recurring funding to support and enhance our public safety efforts across the system. We, we were awarded a $1 million per year ongoing for safety and security, but we also received an additional $8 million over the next two years in one-time funding. The ongoing funds will be used to increase the planned number of public safety staff on campus, expand overtime patrol shifts per week, add an additional K-9 unit for special events and campus security. The new one-time money, the $8 million uh, funds, will be used uh, to assist in replacing outdated security equipment, outdated building access technology, and support ongoing maintenance of the IT systems that support safety technology. We're working now to make sure that we plan for the best use of that one-time funding to leverage those dollars as best we can for the next two years. In alignment with Impact 2025, the university is offering a variety of emergency response training programs this summer and fall. Effective training programs, we believe, have helped ensure coordination, alignment, and clarity around response roles and responsibilities in the event of an emergency. Emergency training is also a facet of the university's clear requirements that the university must fulfill. We are providing staff with system-wide first responders, athletic operations, communications, administrations, and emergency management with tabletop exercises and courses that will help us prepare for events that we hope never happen. Finally, I'd like to give you an update on the problem property at 1721 University Avenue. We continue to monitor and meet with the city to ensure that any reopening of that property is consistent with safety concerns of the neighborhood and with the requirements of the city of Minneapolis. We will continue to meet regularly with them and we will continue to meet with the operators of that 1721 property, University Avenue property to ensure that it's operated in a way that is safe and consistent. And finally, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, Interim President Ettinger and I will <clears throat> provide you more updates on safety planning for the next year. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Senior Vice President Franz, for your very comprehensive report on public safety. Any questions or discussion? Uh, yes, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Really briefly, um, thank you, Senior Vice President Franz, for your report. I'm a big fan of these reports during the regular board meetings, so thank you for that. Uh, just a few compliments I want to give specifically uh, on the safety walks. I think those have been really valuable, bringing people together. Um, I've seen a lot of the, speaking to the HR and hiring and all things that you talked about, um, how I've seen all of the UMD hiring, or the UMPD um, hiring announcements on social media, which I think is great. Um, again, fits under the umbrella of 
of increasing collaboration uh, and some of those soft um, interpersonal things between UMPD and the campus community as well. Um, it was great uh, to attend alongside Regents Wheeler, Gully, and Kenyanya, um, the UMPD open house. Um, at, at the last, or we were here for some meetings, uh, and uh, that was really a great opportunity as well and saw a lot of other university community members there. Uh, it, again, this all kind of falls under uh, the general compliment I want to make, which is not only are they good kind of safety planning steps, but it's I think these are all, and the things that you said and other things, under the umbrella of keeping a robust commitment to uh, collaboration among stakeholders in the university community. So um, I appreciate hearing the updates, look forward to the safety planning for the upcoming year. I know there was a meeting, I think, while we were here um, that was led by our local government affairs team with businesses and others in Dinky Town, which was great to see. And I look forward to hearing the, the um, report back from that. Uh, and then especially in Dinky Town, how we're now collaborating with Block by Block, UMPD, Violence Interrupters, MPD, the business community. You know, that's how um, through that community organizing and other things. And I appreciate that we'll, we are being a catalyst for that, um, bringing folks together. Um, to do that and I keep thinking about this great work in the context of coming here the last couple of days but also just knowing and seeing it but also knowing that our freshman orientations are happening um, and how important it's going to be for us to talk about and represent this work um, within those freshman orientations as well so um, I this has been a topic that's been of keen interest to me so I felt it was important to speak on it and express um, appreciation so thank you thank you thank you very much any other comments or questions uh, Regent Turner. Senior Vice President France. Thank you, Chair. Um, who's paying for these lights that are being replaced that we're doing all the assessment work? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Regent, uh, the city of Minneapolis. We just pointed okay. out where they needed to put the lights. Because <laughs> so I'll get on their case if they're not, so. <laughs> <laughs> we had a little checkbox, and, and, okay. and, and they're, they're fulfilling that with their money, so. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You know, when this all started out, my initial reaction about all this is how how do we address this issue when how do we stop crime? I mean, underlying all of this issue is crime, uh, by and large, by people who do not attend the university coming in from the outside, from wherever they're coming in. Uh, and our initial reaction was to respond to what do we do to respond to the crime once it happens. But now what it's evolved into is I think the significant role the university is playing in trying to prevent crime from actually happening on our campus and off campus as well. And I think your office and Chief Clark's work and uh, the university community work in this area to try and stop it before it begins is absolutely critical. So thank you very much for all of your efforts. And, thank you. and I share those compliments again with the police department and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, with that, uh, we will move to the report of the committees. Mm -hmm. uh, and following our normal practice for consent reports, if there are multiple items voted on in the committee, all items recommended unanimously will be taken together in one vote unless any member of the board would like to separate any of those items from the motion. We're going to begin uh, first with the report of audit and compliance. Regent Kenyanya has turned that over to Regent Farnsworth to report on the work of that committee. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Go ahead, Regent Farnsworth. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair Mayron. In the absence of Chair Kenyanya, the Audit and Compliance Committee did not consider any action items this month. Chief Auditor Galswick provided the committee with an internal audit update, reporting that 35% of the outstanding recommendations rated as essential were resolved by university departments. This is slightly lower than the expected implementation rate of 40%, but a substantial increase from, the, from February's 18% rate. The next update will come in October. In our second item, Chief Auditor Galswick outlined the fiscal year 2024 internal audit plan. The plan includes 18 unit and process audits balanced across the system. Chief Auditor Galswick provided an, an overview of the strategic development of the plan, which continues to reflect the principles of the integrated framework of internal control. In addition to the 18 planned audits, internal audit expects to perform audit work associated with any changes to the university's healthcare partnerships or with the peak in implementation along with standard senior leader transition audits. 
The plan also addresses areas that the board and university leadership have noted institutional risk may exist. Finally, the committee received the new annual report on institutional risk and financial reports as an information item. Thank you, Chair Mayron. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Uh, the next report is from the Lit Litigation Review Committee. Uh, I am going to report on behalf of Regent Hipsch. The Litigation Review Committee was canceled and did not meet yesterday. That oh, concludes geez. Regent Hipsch's <laughs> report. All right. <laughs> I'm now moving to the report of Finance and Operations Committee. Uh, Regent Hipsch was to report on that as well, and I am going to report that for him. The report of the Finance and Operations Committee includes three items this month. All items were unanimously recommended by the committee for approval by the board. Those items include the following. The resolution related to fiscal year 2024 annual capital improvement budget. Adoption of the proposed amendments to the Board of Regents Policy Endowment Fund and the consent report, which included two purchases of goods and services, $1 million and over, allocation of proceeds from the long-term capital financing program, appointments to the Board of Trustees for the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum Foundation, one employment agreement, and the resolution related to refunding of general obligation debt. Moving now to my comments here. Uh, before I call for a vote, would any regent wish to separate an item recommended by the committee from the motion? All right, so hearing none, I'll pause for a moment to see if there are any regent questions or comments on any of the items related to the Finance and Operations Committee report. All right. Uh, then uh, uh, I need a motion to approve of those items. Would someone move that, please? So moved. Thank Second. you. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please say by saying no. The motion carries. Regent Hipsch, any additional comments? Committee business? No. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 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 All right. Can we speak to thin air? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll then move to the Mission Fulfillment Committee, Regent Davenport, who is here alive and well. Would you please Thank you, give us Aaron. your report? The Mission Fulfillment Committee had two action items this month. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the proposed amendments to board policy, disability resources, and a consent report, which includes a number of academic program changes and conferral of tenure. All right. Uh, before I call for a vote, would any regent wish to separate an item recommended by the committee uh, from the motion? Hearing none, I'll pause for a moment to see if there is any questions or comments by colleagues. Hearing none, then uh, Regent Davenport, do you, if you'd like I to make a motion. Move to approve the committee report. Thank you. All those in favor of the report, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by saying no. The motion carries. Regent Davenport, any additional committee business? Thank you, Chair Mayron. That concludes my report. All right. And uh, finally, the Governance and Policy Committee. Uh, Regent, Regent Verhalen, are you able to make your report, or do you have someone here that needs to make it for you? I am able to make it. Can you hear me, Chair Mayron? We can, thank you. Very good. The Governance and Policy Committee acted on one item this month. The committee voted unanimously to recommend adoption of the proposed amendments to Board of Regents policy namings and renamings. All right. Uh, are there any uh, comments or questions by colleagues on that item? Hearing none, Re Regent Verhalen, if you'd like to make your motion. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I move adoption of the proposed amendments. All right, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. The motion carries. Thank you very much, Regent Verhalen. That brings us to old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, getting the gavel out. That concludes the business for today. This meeting of the Board of Regents is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, okay.